Did you ever think you were making it? I feel I'm so close, I can take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value came in, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Look, for those of you guys joining us on Saturday morning, okay, 9 a.m., 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, to hear two legends at the same time in one podcast, podcast number 312 with Tim Pool and Jimmy Dore in the house, uh, we're going to have a very unique show. We got a lot of things to cover today. Uh, we had a great event with you last night, your event in Miami. That was fantastic with yourself, Matt Gates, uh, O'Keefe, Luke, and uh, my... Uh, uh, a uh, little pharma guy, yeah, I not big pharma. Ian, Ian. Yeah. Ian who is guy. funny as him. hell. Yeah, he's love funny him. as hell. We had yeah. a good time. But, uh, yeah, it was fantastic yesterday. Just listen to everybody, the exchange. I thought it was a great event. I think you stole the show. You had that great, uh, uh, we'll call it speech, about, mm-hmm. you know, you said you don't pray for tolerance anymore. You have to hope. All that stuff. The crowd went nuts. They all stood up, gave you yeah. a standing ovation. Big standing <laughs> ovation, PBD. A standing ovation awesome. at a podcast is yeah. pretty freaking impressive. Yeah. Tim, congrats, man. The event yeah, was awesome. awesome. And just on a personal note, your boys, Luke, Ian, Seamus, even awesome crew you got, man. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, Seamus hosts Freedom Tunes. It's, he, he produces a, that's his own show. Luke, of course, of We Are Changed. So they, they're running their own business as well. To be able to have them come down is an honor, honor, honor and a privilege, as well as you, uh, Patrick. It was just a dream come true, man. Mm-hmm. And talk about the timing. We booked this, uh, uh, we've been working <laughs> on it for a year. And so when this past week happened with Matt Gates fighting in Congress, and then I'm looking at the calendar, I'm like, we are very lucky. <laughs> we have Matt Gates. Sometimes I'm looking down the on week. you. Yeah, that was great. Jimmy, how you been, Jimmy? And Matt Gates is a terrorist, and he's really creating uh, yeah. chaos. And I don't know why he doesn't follow the norms. This is, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. really offended. And, oh, uh, you know, the Democrats don't have these kind of problems. <laughs> and, and, they and all fall in line and lockstep, and they're proud of it. Right. Yeah. Pfizer, they, you know, they're, they're real nice. He should just be nice to the lobbyists and the mm-hmm. pharmaceutical yes. companies. And, I thought yeah. he was way more likable than the media portrays him. He was actually, he, was hanging well, back. he actually went to college with me right around the same time. We did the math there, but don't you yeah, find congratulations it? on landing that right at the, uh, the Shout out to Matt crescendo Gates, of it. Didn't they go after, so they went after Matt Gates like a year or two ago because they knew they couldn't control him and they tried mm-hmm. to pin him out of being a pedophile. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, that's, the, that's the game. They that's did Julian playbook. Assange, they're doing it to Rusty Rockets, they're mm-hmm. doing it to, they did it to him, but like, oh, that's right, they already tried to do that mm-hmm. to him and it's because they knew they couldn't control him. And so I loved when he gave that speech on the floor talking about, I, I'm going to, uh, th- this body is bought and by big donor money, mm-hmm. and they booed him. Only place in the world that would get a boo is in Congress when you're mm-hmm. saying that the government's bought by big money donors. And, if, and anywhere else in the world, they would cheer him, but inside Congress, that's how corrupted it. Boo! And he said, go ahead and boo because I'll be raising more money through small dollar donations, and I'm going to go right to the he people. He talked about that last night as well. He brought that up. By the way, we got a lot of things to cover. Okay, a lot of things to cover. We got the Israel-Palestine okay. issue that just took place. We'll talk about that. want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, we got to talk about Matt Gates, McCarthy. We'll get into that as well. Donald Trump fo- followers being targeted by the FBI. 2024 election story just came out. Hillary Clinton talking about there needs to be a formal deprogramming of the Trump cult members. We'll show that clip and react to it. Ron DeSantis jabs at Trump, says he would be a lame duck president if elected. Trump fears being poisoned, using individual mini ketchup bottles. Uh, polls about RFK, curious to know if RFK Jr.'s independent run could pull from Trump or from Biden. That's a conversation a lot of people are having. Biden administration, Jimmy, you, you'll be very impressed with this one here. They have decided to build a wall, which is such an honorable thing to do. <laughs> racist. Good for That's them. some yeah. racist. Well, I hope they break all the environmental rules that they set up to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, that's the story, by the way. So then we'll talk about Ukraine. Curious to know what your thoughts are today with Ukraine, especially a story that came out saying fewer Americans support arming Ukraine, a poll that came out. <clears throat> Diversity numbers amongst delegates trigger alarm at DNC meetings. And then we'll talk about ahead of 2024, felons are fighting to regain the right to vote. I don't know if this is felons. I don't know if it's a party trying to get felons to get the right to vote, but either way, we'll talk about it. Putin is saying America always needs an enemy. He's talking nuclear. He's talking big game. We'll play a clip, react to that. Your boss might just give you a raise for showing up to the office. Bosses are given raises if you work from office. 
I was here early. Home. I was here early, by the way. That's why you got to raise. Mean, thank you got to raise. Let's go, baby. And then Adidas Kanye uh, West didn't mean the anti Semitic <laughs> remarks, which <laughs> I definitely want to get your yeah. thoughts on it. <laughs> but I say we start off I say we start off with Israel and Palestine. I mean, this literally just happened. How much are you following the story with what happened? Not at all. Okay. Are you, Jimmy, at all following it? No, I haven't. Okay. So this little, we woke up Twitter, to it, yeah. and this yeah. happened. So why don't we read, Rob, if you got one of the stories or video clips to show. Uh, Israel says it's at war after surprise attack from Gaza. Uh, Netanyahu even uh, said we're at war. Uh, did you say last week uh, Hamas attacked Israel, 200 Israelis? Two, 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 uh, uh, Hamas is claiming that last week alone 200 uh, Palestinians were killed, and this is, this is one of their, their payback attacks. But they planned it. It's a holiday. This is a, it's, it's a Jewish holiday today, isn't it, Adam? Well, here's what's going on. Uh, last week was Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day um, on the Jewish calendar. It's the Day of Atonement. And this attack took place, talk about symbolism, on the 50th day of the anniversary of the uh, Yom Kippur War, which was in uh, 1973. So um, do you want to get into some of the details? Yeah, okay, go for go it. Ahead. Well, uh Coinciding sort of with all this, I don't know how closely you guys pay attention to Israeli politics. It's not exactly I wake up and read Israeli politics, but I was just there. Um, I took my mom for her first time in 30 years, and um, she lived on a kibbutz back in the day. I, fr I went for a wedding, and um, you saw the protests that were going on against Bibi Netanyahu, okay, Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the longest standing prime minister in Israeli history. I think this is his 16th year, his fifth term. It started in early 2000s or late 90s. Early 2000s. He's been around forever. But the whole premise with him right now um, is he's sort of the he's, he runs the Likud party, it's sort of the Trump of Israel. Basically, he's sort of the, the, the right wing there. And um, he's been, you know, accusations of uh, fraud and, and uh, embezzlement, and what have you. You know, whether that's right or wrong, that's the sort of what's going on. But uh, where he's come under heat lately is because he's basically trying to reform the Supreme Court because he feels they're too liberal. So the platform that he's been running on is that he's the guy that's going to make Israel safe, okay? There's no doubt that whether you're left and right, because it's you go to Tel Aviv, it's very, very left. Like LGBT, pride, all that. You go to Jerusalem, and it's, I mean, as conservative as it gets. Yeah. So he's trying to reform the... Um, uh, Knesset, the uh, Supreme Court and the, and the Parliament over there, because uh, he feels they've gone too liberal. But uh, he's been running on the platform that he's the guy that's going to keep Israel safe. Uh, from what I'm hearing, because I text my buddy who I was at um, at his wedding, he's like, yeah, this is, I, I thought this would basically make citizens coalesce, like sort of how like 9-11 happened here, and like didn't matter if you were a Republican or Democrat. I said, what's your take on this? And he's not a Bibi Netanyahu fan. I said, will this make you appreciate him more right he goes no it's the exact opposite because the entire platform he ran on was he's the guy that's going to keep israel safe so what you're kind of sort of hearing on the ground is what happened bb what's going on this is not a good look for the idf it's not a good look for Mossad, who's the intelligence agency and basically the story is this was sort of a coordinated sneak attack they it was land air pa sea paragliders right? boats everything They're going in there rockets and, and everything uh, uh, netanyahu has officially declared war on just to be clear hamas now how familiar are you guys with the concept of hamas so hamas is a militant uh, terrorist organization that the us government has labeled terrorist they're sort of a hezbollah from iran and they were founded i believe in 1987 with the basic premise that they will never ever ever recognize the state of Israel. And um, they came from the origins, I believe, of the Muslim Brotherhood, which spouted out of um, Egypt, I want to say. And they reject all peace agreements whatsoever. So now I think 5,000 uh, rockets have been fired to Israel. There's been uh, 500 injured, 40 dead. Um, you know, the Iron Dome that Israel has, that U.S. has sort of funded. As, as, as of when? As of, this is as of this morning. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, yeah. it's crazy. No, there's 5,000. I mean, yeah, imagine. It's bad. it's bad. So I text my buddy, just to kind of put it into context. I text my buddy. I said, how you doing over there? He goes, I woke up to uh, the sounds of sirens, bombs, uh, destruction. I go, how you doing? He goes, you know what? And this is sort of like Israeli satire. Yeah. He goes, uh, I had a taco party planned uh, for today. They ruined <laughs> Hamas, ruined my like, freaking taco that's, that's party. The line, man. A taco yeah, I mean, party. it's like, how are you going to ruin my party? But um, so funny. The the um, the the bigger thing that I think that we should understand here, as far as Israel goes, 
and U.S. goes, because if you're in the United States, you're like, all right, how does this affect me? What Bibi Netanyahu has done is sort of recognize I'm never going to make peace with these guys. You know, it started with the Oslo Accords with um, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat under Clinton in 93. And they've been trying to make peace with these guys forever. Hamas does not want peace. And you might say, well, who's Hamas? Are they the government? Well, actually, they have a majority of parliament. It'd be like literally the equivalent of in the United States, KKK had more than 50 percent representation in Congress, mm -hmm. which is insane to me. So the president, Mahmoud Abbas, he runs the... Um, Palestinian National Authority. But what Bibi has done, and this is ultimately my point, is he said, look, I'm not going to make friends with the 1% over here. What I'm going to do is open up diplomatic and peace relationships with the rest of the Middle East. And that's been his entire agenda. So they've had longstanding peace agreements with uh, Egypt, with Jordan, which are their bordering neighbors. But it, since the Abraham Accords, which was under Trump in 2020, when he moved the... Um, the uh, what do you move from uh, embassy. the embassy, embassy exactly to Jerusalem? They've made peace with uh, the UAE, with uh, Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, and now in, in in the middle of all this, I don't know if you saw that story, Wall Street Journal. Saudi Arabia is in the in the in the final innings of coming to a peace agreement with Israel. Saudi, wow. yeah. okay, and Saudi has said they quote unquote are willing to raise the oil output to basically appease the Biden administration, uh, to get this deal done. Like, Saudi wants to get this done. Why? Because they want security. They want weapons. They want intelligence. You know, Israel, you know, love them or hate them, whatever you want to say to them, they have the right to defend themselves. That's the whole thing. But they, when you talk about um, the Mossad and the IDF, when you talk about intelligence, talk about tech, you have this small little startup company, country, uh, that is, was since 1948 and is an economic miracle. And what the, they're the ones that now the rest of the Middle East is yeah. saying, why would we want to get make befriend Palestinians and we should make uh, peace with Israel? So uh, the, the, the bottom line is you, I thought this would sort of help Bibi, but this might end up hurting him. And how it affects the United States are all these peace agreements specifically with Saudi Arabia. Jimmy, how should the U.S. react to this? How should the U.S., how should Biden, how should uh, the president of the United States react to this? You know, I don't, I'm not an expert on Palestine-Israel relations. I don't know how it's ever, I don't think it's ever going to be resolved. I don't see, you know, at first uh, I thought a one-state solution was the best thing, but that's never, and then I thought just two-state. And so I really am not the guy to, to talk to about this. I, but um, I do know that Israel has been bombing Syria. Uh, and no one gives a shit, and uh, so they're just allowed to do whatever they want. I know they have a nuke, uh, and so, uh, but it's good to hear that, that Saudi Arabia and that they're starting to make peace. I don't understand why the other Arab countries, uh, and I need it explained to me, why they don't do something about Palestine and why, uh, you know, in the Gaza Strip. What, what, what is their responsibility the, to this? The, and I'm no israeli palestinian expert but i've been there a bunch and i know people and i have friends and this is a, mm -hmm. this is you know israel is the only democracy in the middle east it's not even close and uh so you ask like who are your allies pbd is coming out with a book called choose your enemies wisely look i, I actually empathize with the people of gaza you know they have a term called jihad which is a holy war it's a two-part war uh, one is the spiritual struggle internally and one is the external struggle which literally means killing people on behalf of your uh, your belief. But if you talk about allies, who is Israel's allies? Okay, we just said the, the peace treaties, but United States beyond that. Uh, Hamas is a Sunni organization, okay? Uh, but their allies are um, Iran. That's their major ally with Hezbollah and um, the militants that's going on over there. So uh, Iran, Syria, um, I think, I believe Qatar, um, that's who they are in bed with. So you look at the rest of the Middle East, you know, you're, you're familiar with Sunni, Shiite, Iran, uh, the, 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 the constant struggle with Saudi Arabia. Um, they're, they're picking sides. Just like you think, why, why don't Arabs all get along? Sunni, Shiite, like this is a major thing for them. Uh, and it goes way deeper than anything we've ever known here in America where, where Republicans and Democrats are constantly fighting. It's never been stopping. Tim. You know, I think the, cha the challenge for me, obviously, is I'm not hyper-focused on Israel-Palestine. I think Correct. everyone's saying the same thing. But uh, the bigger picture, going back uh, like 10 years or so, I remember when I think they did, what was it called, Protective Edge? I'm, I'm not sure what the, the campaign was, 
where it was described as many people on the uh, anti-war left as mowing the lawn. I think it's a phrase attributed with what Israel does. Every few years they go to war. Yeah, it's 2014. There you go. Uh, uh, so they, they call that the Gaza War in 2014. Protective edge. That's right. And uh, uh, it was viewed, and uh, many journalists explained to me that those, and again, I'm not an expert on this. They call it mowing the lawn, where every few years Israel is at war with Gaza to decimate and destroy their weapons, their, their supply depots and things like right. this. But the big fear is every time they do this, it antagonizes the Middle East and other countries that are upset over what's going on in Palestine. And at the time, there was concern that if Iran begins supplying more weapons or, or ups the ante in some capacity, one, it could lead to just obvious widespread destabilization of the region, which we're already you know, not happy about. I think things have improved with the Abraham Accords and a lot of these peace agreements. My fear is this could seek to destabilize that problem. But the bigger issue I see now, especially with Ukraine and Taiwan, is you know, we can't handle any more conflict right. escalating to this point. If and, and this may be occurring because the U.S. is entering a new quagmire. For, for what reason? It's not been justified. I have no idea. What Gazprom, gas monopolies, cutting off uh, Russia from the Black Sea because we want to control the price of gas or something like this. Then you've got, as we're hyper-focused in Eastern Europe, China's flying, right. uh, 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 what do they call it, sorties or whatever, over Taiwanese, uh, Taiwan's air, air defense zone. And so I'm just sitting back like either the media is just screaming in my face at the top of their lungs to scare me or we are we are experiencing way too much international conflict and destabilization. And considering the politics of the United States and what's happening internationally with, you know, this the, the civil conflict in the West with what they call the far right across Europe as well as the United States, you know, people are calling it civil war and World War Three all bottled up into one. The last thing I need to do is wake up after this beautiful Friday night party yeah. with war is More breaking war. out now in the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, Tim, you make up a great point. I mean, this is the definition of whack-a-mole. You right. know, you're focusing on Ukraine. Oh, oh, what are we doing with China and Taiwan? Oh, look, what's going? the war is going on in Israel. So it begs the question, what is America's role in all this? Are we the world's police? Do we get involved? Do we get involved in proxy wars? It's, it, well, it's problematic. Um, America, so uh, I think the Palestine-Israel is a different conflict than all the other conflicts, right? So Ukraine, Russia, China, these are all provoked by the United States. And we're, uh, you know, what's happening in, in Ukraine is just, a money laundering operation and it's there so that we could have more liquefied natural gas from western uh, countries uh, sold to Europe and that's why we bombed the Nord Stream pipeline and uh, you know Joe Biden had pr uh, predicted he would do it in February, right? He said if Putin has tanks that go across into Ukraine, we're going to end the Nord Stream pipeline. So that's what this was always about. And it was provoked. Uh, uh, we provoked Putin to do that. But, you know, what's funny is that everybody uh, starts the story of Ukraine with Putin's invasion. But that and the way the way I tell it, it's like if Putin was standing at a bus stop and there was an old lady in the street and there was a bus coming right for her and Putin pushed that lady down on the sidewalk to get out of the bus, the s mainstream media starts that story, Putin pushes old lady down, <laughs> yeah. and they, they leave out the beginning, like, no, there was a bus coming, and he was trying yeah. to save, so they forget, they leave out the part that in 2014, the United States and the CIA instituted a coup in Ukraine with the right-wing Nazis, and the people in the eastern part of Ukraine didn't want to go along with that coup government, and so they resisted it, and so that coup government, the Nazis, started bombing the Donbass, there actually was a peace agreement called the Minsk Accords, guess who broke that? The Ukraine. It wasn't uh, Russia. It wasn't Putin. It wasn't the people of the Donbass. So finally, after eight years of shelling and two peace agreements that were broken uh, and the threat of putting uh, uh, Ukraine into NATO and all the, uh, uh, Putin said, hey, if you just promise me you won't put them into Ukraine, I won't invade. They wouldn't do that. Why? Because they wanted this to happen because they they when they ended Afghanistan, they needed a new war for the military industrial complex. So when people were giving Biden all that credit for ending Afghanistan, even though he did it horribly, people were still giving giving him credit, I was like, well, let's wait and see what he's going to do with that money that they've been spending in Afghanistan, because I bet they have another war up their sleeve, and son of a bitch, they did. It was Ukraine, which they've been ramping up for for at least eight years, and they've admitted that they've been doing this and ramping up and provoking this, and anybody who knows anything about it, this was completely 100% provoked. They wanted this to happen. They ramped up the bombing in February so Putin would invade. They doubled it. So that's what's happening, and the same thing, And if you think Russia and China, we have 800 military bases around 
around the world. We just built three more in the Philippines to get ready for this uh, saber rattling with China. And they just built a military base in Syria as they call Putin a thug and a gangster for doing what he's doing in Ukraine. We are occupying a country right next door, a third of it, which third, the oil part. And we just built a military base there. And that's why they hate Trump, because he told the truth about it when they asked him, hey, why are you leaving troops there? And he said, for the oil, it's our oil. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they can't have the He told the truth about our foreign policy. And that's why they got to get rid of him. Yeah. A quick response to that. You're, you're absolutely right. The, the Ukraine situation has been a marketing campaign to basically I, most Americans could not pick out Ukraine on a map. That's right. Of just Ukraine. <laughs> so uh, I, I think the uh, what's going on in Israel and Palestine, the U.S. does not need to get involved in that. They might fund an operation. They might be involved. They're not going to have boots on the ground. They're not getting involved in that whatsoever. And the, you've seen the numbers, how Americans, especially even Democrats, have plummeted for their approval of what's going on in Ukraine. Do we have those numbers? Um, but uh, in the, the biggest problem in— uh, Adam, what are, you, what are you getting to? Because I'm trying to read this poll here. Okay. What, are you, what are you getting to? No, is that— we're, America should not focus okay. necessarily on right, So let me read this, this. story. So should, fewer, focus on Ukraine. Going back on what you were talking with you, um, uh, Ukrainians, fewer Americans support arming Ukraine poll. This is the hail. A Reuters poll uh, or survey a significant drop in supporting Americans for sending arms to Ukraine with only 41% of respondents favoring such action in October, down from 65% in June of 2023. That's a big drop, by the way, 24%. Support for sending arms to Ukraine has declined across political parties. Democratic support dropped from 81% to 52%, and Republican support dropped from 56 to 35 Independent support went from 57 to 44 The survey also indicates that support for sending financial aid to Ukraine is even lower with 37% of respondents favoring it in October survey, the decline in support comes amidst debates uh, over government funding and evolving dynamics of 2024 GOP presidential primary. You know, I, I we had this really extended media uh, cycle about the pipes in Flint, Michigan. And then it expanded after the Flint, Michigan pipes. The kids are getting sick. There's Legionnaire's disease. The water was bad. Then we learn it's bad in Newark. Then we learn it's bad in Pittsburgh. Uh -huh. and, and all of these Democrats are coming out saying we must get funding to fix this. <laughs> and now all these people are saying we must give this money to Ukraine so we can have war. And I said, I have a compromise. How about we fix all the pipes in Pittsburgh, Newark? Flint apparently is doing better, but... Let's build American infrastructure. Let's help the poor in our cities. Let's whatever education program, whatever health care program. Hey, how about the 250 billion or whatever goes here? But the weirdest thing to me is to see young leftists on social media being like, we have to stand with Ukraine. I'm oh, like, right. why? And, you know, uh, so I think the hypocrisy right there for me and, and the people I know, they're, they're asking themselves, why did we spend all this money over there when we had a decade of, of, of water problems in our, in our own country? But more importantly, when I pulled up the battle map, uh, a couple weeks ago of Ukraine, I was shocked because I wasn't tracking the on the ground stuff with Ukraine as much. I was shocked to discover that Russia won because they've been telling us over and over and over again that we've been win that we're, we're winning. Russia's decimated. They're conscripting people. They're in panic. And there's these videos of like the Ukrainian soldier flicking the cigarette and being like, yeah. love Ukraine or whatever. <laughs> and then I, you pulled the battle map and you're like, wait, so Russia secured the entire Donbass land bridge uh, yeah. from, from the Donbass, uh, the land bridge into Crimea, which was their which was their stated goal. So so I feel like every story coming out saying we are winning and let's go. And I'm like, Russia wanted to control access to Crimea. It's their access to the Mediterranean, through the Black Sea, through the Bosphorus, into the Mediterranean, because they want to, that's how they, they ship a lot of their oil and gas. And what, what the threat was to them was that if Ukraine joins NATO and the EU, it cuts off Crimea. Well, first of all, before all this in 2014, before Crimea was basically taken by Russia, and they had a referendum, call it whatever you want, the, 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 the threat Russia's facing is we have the Sevastopol base, we transport a lot of our energy through this through through here. If Ukraine falls to the EU and NATO, we lose access to the Mediterranean. We can't allow that. So first thing they do, they walk out of their naval base in Sevastopol and say, we're already here, actually, quote unquote, referendum, take it. With the expansion of the war, they needed to secure access into Crimea outside of just the, the actual bridge over water, which we saw bombed uh, not that long ago. Now I'm looking at this map and we have it right here. Wow, Russia, Russia's secured land access into Crimea, which was their, their, uh, my, my understanding was their stated goal. They're pushing past towards Odessa now, which is insane. And when I talk to, you know, neocon types, the uh, pro-war uh, establishment types on the left or liberal Democrat, whatever you want to call it, they keep saying, no, uh, Vladimir Putin wants Poland. 
No, no, oh, Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Has, yeah. And I was like, I what's, what strategic value does Vladimir Putin have right now economically? Look, you want to make the argument that Putin's 20-year plan is to invade Poland? Fine. But right now, what we're dealing with, this makes total sense in terms of bringing oil into the Mediterranean, competing with, uh, on, the, on the oil market. And you telling me that Vladimir Putin is a comic book villain who wants to take over the world means nothing. It says nothing about his strategy, nothing about where he's placing his troops. When I look at this, I'm like, oh, right. He wants the land bridge into Crimea to secure it so that you can't kick him out. He's gotten it. That seems like a military goal. It seems like Ukraine's lost this one mm -hmm. and we're dumping money down the toilet. Mm -hmm. A question I got for you, Jimmy, is why, why is it... Because no matter where you went, your Democrats all had the Ukrainian flag, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. The other day we're in New York where Yankees game gets canceled. We go to a bowling event. The U.N. is in New York. Bill Clinton shows up with his uh, Ukraine We're pin. talking to him. Son He's got the bitch. Ukraine uh, yeah. uh, pin on, right, instead of the red, white, and blue. But why are, why are Democrats now dropping? This is not like a small difference, by the way. They went from 81 to 52. Republicans, 56 to 35 independents, 50s. This is not a small number. Why do you think now people are saying, guys, we got to stop? I think because they're starting to hear counter narratives. Be like they're, they're hearing from people like uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, my show, Rusty Rockets, all. And so it's starting to seep in the truth about what's going on over there. And they see how they don't give a shit about America. So this, I remember I had Marion Williamson on my show a month or two ago, and she's pro Ukraine war and funding it. And and I was like, why do you think that they're doing that? And she's like, well, we're trying to help the people of Ukraine. I go, if you think this is about helping people, well, don't you think we'd start helping people here in America first? Which is what Tim <laughs> yeah. just said five minutes ago. That well, Why wouldn't we start here? if we really? Of course they don't care about yeah. people. They don't even take care of the people in uh, Maui right now. They, they, nothing. They don't give a shit about them. they got people living under every bridge. Nobody cares. It's not about the people. They wouldn't even give us health care. Still, people still go bankrupt when they get sick in America, the only Western country that happens in. So this is all about money laundering and why is the numbers going down? I think because people are starting to realize this is stupid and all the money we're sending, they're starting to get another counter narrative. Bobby Kennedy's out there talking about it and it's getting talked about on Joe Rogan. And so uh, those are that's the biggest platform in the world, right? So people are starting to hear a counter narrative before and now they're starting to get caught up to what the game is happening. That's what I think's happening. So let me let me follow up on that. So you saw the GOP debate, the second one that took place, right? And whether it was- I the, did not. Oh, you didn't see it. Okay, so Nikki Haley- Tim Scott, a lot of them are still yeah. pro-funding pro yeah. the Ukrainian yeah. war, but if their so campaign the manager senators. or their helpers are sitting there saying, guys, 81 to 52, 56 to 35, 57 to 44, this is not a winning, like, what are you doing? The American people are sick of the spending. Why are they still sticking they're, to their position to defend that? Because they're sticking to their, their loyalty isn't to the American people. Their loyalty is to their donors. And their donor class wants this, right? So the donor class is Wall Street, the uh, fossil fuel companies, and the military industrial complex. And they want this, and that's that, and they don't serve the people. And that's what Matt Gates is talking about. And, and that's why they're booing him in Congress, because he's talking about giving the Congress back to the people and they can't have that because they want it to be owned by the donor class, which it is. And, and look how brilliant it is, though, Jimmy. Like, first they, like, remember when it came out, Pat, like, remember that first six months? Ukraine, everybody had the flag. Everybody had yeah. it on Instagram. Just like when BLM, everybody put that black square like it did shit. Like, that black square <laughs> did anything. But then, Pat, look look, look at their, their brilliance, Jimmy. They do all that. They do all that. Then it gets to the point where the word is out. But now it's like, it's too late. We already gave the money. Yeah. We're already embedded. What are you going to do? Just like the border. Look at the border. For, for, for almost four years, Years, Mayorkas, all these assholes are like, no, mm -hmm. no, it's not a crisis. Not now. Now they're like, yeah, it's time to build a wall. Too late. There's seven fucking million people here. Sorry for my language. But, seven but, million. And the, uh, but the reason for it is because now you got Democrats in these big cities complaining. Yep. So yeah. their 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 party members are saying, hey, we're dealing with a problem. It's going to cost us votes. And yep. they're like, okay, we'll build the wall now. Yeah. But maybe this war in Ukraine has woken up the people that maybe never woke up about that stuff. Just sort of just. Operated this, on a, I, on a following that, and I wouldn't be surprised media. if Zelensky's right. on a plane right now to go to the White House to be like, "Hey, listen, yeah. don't do nothing, uh, uh, Israel. Exactly. Don't get involved. That's my money. Don't help them I, at all." I think to, and to Tim's point, this is my question for Tim. This is why I, I think you made such a great point. You know, the whole America First agenda. When you heard that first from Trump. There's a lot of people that basically labeled that racist. America first, fuck the rest of the world, yeah. basically. Hold on, what? Hold on, what's going on here? But you pointedly gave the example of things like Flint or uh, in um, Pennsylvania, whatever, these things. And now Americans are realizing, hold on. 
I, I was fed, you know, this Ukraine thing for 6, 12, 18 months. Well, yeah. What's going on here? In Flint? But here's my question to you. You know, when we asked you uh, about, you know, your knowledge of Israel, you're like, like, I don't follow this much. Dude, you just like almost like you you are like a battlefield general in Ukraine. You, you, you know this inside out. Is this something that you've been following for, well, 18 months or to be 10 fair, years? I was there just before the coup happened in 2014 or 20. So I was I went there in 2013. I produced a couple documentaries for Vice Breaking Down what was going on. And I talked to a lot of people there. I, 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 I actually got to uh, I wasn't there when they toppled the statue of Lenin, but it, I got there literally right afterwards and saw the statue ripped down and people were smashing it with hammers. It was a crazy sight to see. So uh, I have friends there. I the country's fantastic. The food's great. The people are awesome. And it, it was it was a, a really amazing trip for me when I was down there from 2013 to 2014. And then uh, watching how it has devolved since then, I think, you know, I don't know what the intention was, what what uh, uh, I suppose I, what the United States machine was hoping to get out of coverage from something like me, uh, from someone like me or whatever. All that ended up happening was I, I, I despise the efforts uh, of the West to, to exacerbate this war more, having been there and met people there. And I have friends who are they fled the country and 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 for for what reason this thing this, this goes back right I, I may not be able to tell you about the inner workings of, actually you know what i got to stop I, I actually probably do know a decent amount about yeah, ukraine considering I, clearly. the burisma stuff uh considering oh. right all of yeah. this uh. i'll give you i'll give you the simple version I am but a humble man who complains on the internet. I read news stories and I read reports. I read academic articles sometimes about the region. And uh, I remember a lot of these articles. So my understanding of what's happening there is, I would just say, news cursory. And there are individuals with clearances and accesses. They probably know more than me. But this goes back to the Qatar Turkey pipeline. I'm sure uh, you guys are familiar. Are you familiar with this? Yes. So the United States, the West, wanted a pipeline from Qatar up through Syria and Turkey into Europe to displace the Gazprom gas monopoly. Syria said explicitly, we are allied with Russia. We will not allow you to do this. In fact, they were going to counter this pipeline by having Iran build a pipeline and run that instead, strengthening the, the eastern uh, uh, energy uh, energy monopoly, whatever you want to call it. It was explicitly reported. I'm, I'm amazed. This is in The Guardian that in 2009, the CIA said we will destroy Syria. We will overthrow them. Lucky, lucky for us, a few years later, a civil war breaks out. We're on the side of, of, of the rebels because this is a country that said we will not allow you to build a pipeline. All of this then connects into you have the Gazprom gas monopoly, which its pipeline runs through Ukraine. All of a sudden, this this energy company pops up in Ukraine where we've got a former CIA director, Hunter Biden on the board. And now everything we're learning with the investigation into the Bidens, into Hunter Biden, Hunter Devin Archer testifying, Hunter Biden calls D.C. and says, we need help. Joe Biden then flies out, says, fire the prosecutor. You know, I, I'll, I'll simplify this for you. Mykola Zlachevsky, the founder of Burisma, it's an energy company. We have massive interests in, in building these energy companies. He is accused of, uh, of uh, corruption. He is under investigation by, my, by uh, Viktor Shokin, the prosecutor in Ukraine. He flees the country after his assets are frozen. Joe Biden comes in and says, oh, the prosecutor's corrupt. Fire him. <laughs> Conveniently, right after his son calls D.C. saying, I need help because they're, they're feeling this pressure. The, the, uh, several months later, Shokin finally resigns. And guess what? Mykola Zlachevsky returns to the country. Now, well, hold on. I thought he, the, what, what's, what? I, he, this, this guy is, is accused of corruption, but he comes back. Joe Biden says at the CFR meeting that, that we brought we got in someone who was solid, someone yes. who was solid, someone who was solid, who cleared this guy. Guess what? When Donald Trump made that phone call saying, what's going on with this? Homie fled the country again because yep. he knew the investigations were back on. There is absolute corruption. And the, the, the fascinating thing is that all of this is in the media. You, it's, you see it reported. But my favorite example of how the media is a is a spattering of CIA, FBI, whatever you want to call it, and sometimes real journalists is just after the 2016 election, Politico reported that Ukrainian officials interfered in the U.S. election to assist Hillary Clinton. Politico has this. You can you can pull this up. Then about a year or two later, Politico reported that very story they reported was Russian disinformation <laughs> without retracting their own story wow. that this has been happening. So 
Oh, I, I could I could talk fifty billion years about all this stuff, but I but think that, my point. You know what? That, that's the thing people don't realize about Syria, which Bobby Kennedy was on to, and that's where I found out about that gas pipeline was through Bobby Kennedy years ago in like twenty seventeen. I'm like, why is there a, a war, and why does the CIA want to overthrow? Uh, uh, Assad. And it turns out that's why we got in bed with, so right now we're in bed with Nazis in Ukraine, legit Hitler Nazis. Yeah. And But in Syria, we were in bed with Al-Qaeda and El-Nusra and the people and who ISIS. are, and <laughs> ISIS, our sworn enemies. Go ahead. Just just to add, the Canadian Parliament gave a standing ovation to a Nazi. To a Nazi. Yeah. Right. Hitler <laughs> 98 Nazi. year old. No background but, check. But, <laughs> and so people don't realize that's what all that Assad was. And, and Tulsi Gabbard stole up and stood up and told the truth about that. And that's why they had to uh, smear her as a Russian agent and all that stuff. Because whoever tells the truth about our foreign policy, when the game that's being played, they immediately get called an Assadist or you get called a Putin puppet or they would call you a Saddam puppet or a traitor to the country. And they're doing the same thing. They're doing Iraq. They're doing it Libya. They're doing it in Syria. They're right. doing it in Ukraine. It's all the same shit and people don't wake up. I can't believe that people who saw them do Iraq and then nobody really looked into Libya and then they saw them do Syria. They got tricked into Syria again and the same game in Ukraine. I can't believe they're falling for but this you know over and Look, over. Here's what it is. Here's what I'm noticing with the trend. <clears throat> they're, 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 they come in saying, I think they will believe us for a year. Yeah, yep. that's all and they need. And then that's all we need. Yep. And with a year, we'll sell enough supplies yep. to make money. And You're then right. all of a sudden, that 81 on Democrat support goes to 52. That's right. Republican goes 56, 35. And then the Independent goes 57 to 44. And by far, the best meme I've seen as a person who's an entrepreneur, I support small business owners, especially some of them that want to work from home, do something part-time. There isn't anybody that's done a better job you know, uh, Rob, if you have this, if you can pull this up, please. I want to make sure the audience sees this. He is the goat of working from home. <laughs> Last month, I made $40 billion working from home. Yeah. Learn how. I think this is the best transition for me to go into our sponsor before we go to the next story. <laughs> so funny. Today's sponsor is American Hartford Gold. In 2022, central banks, uh, central banks globally bought a record-breaking 1,136 tons of gold. There's a reason why they're doing that. According to the Bank of International Settlement, over 90% of central banks are working on a CBDC and one of the ways for you to pre protect your investments. I have owned physical gold for many, many years, a small percentage, but I always buy gold and I set it aside. American Heart for Gold will uh, ship the physical gold to you or the silver directly to your door. You can also set up a 401k if you call them up. They'll show you how to do it. They'll show you how to protect your savings and retirement accounts. They have the finest products, amazing customer service, and a buyback commitment. They have earned a five-star rating from thousands of reviews from A-plus from uh, Better Business Bureau. Tell them I sent you, and they'll give you up to $5,000 free uh, of silver yeah. on your first order. And call uh, the link. Uh, click on a link below or call 866 <laughs> I think Jimmy's about to call him right yeah, now. Jimmy, Jimmy, call right Jimmy's got to step out real quick. 866-939-6984. Again, 866-939-6984. Or text PBD to 65532. Again, text PBD to 65532. Link will be below. Okay, so that's Ukraine. Let's talk Matt Gates. So this week, all of a sudden, I think we all probably remember where we were at where it said, well, uh, McCarthy is fired. You're like, wait, what? Is yeah. this a mistake? Like, yeah. this, is, this is not possible, right? How did this, you know, take place? And then Matt Gates is going out to call him out. You didn't keep your promise. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And yesterday I asked him a question at your event that you had in Miami. I said, when you were doing that, when you were pushing him, did you actually think it was going to be a historic moment where this guy was going to get fired? Or did you just think you're going to scare him? To have like a, you know, publicity, TV, media reaction, kind of sharing your thoughts. And he gave his answer. But from your perspective, you know, what are your thoughts about what happened? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Unpack it for us, Well, Jimmy. this is exact. Matt Gates is doing the exact thing that I championed two years ago when the Democrats had a slim uh, uh, majority, and I wanted the progressives, meaning the squad, AOC and those people, to do what Matt Gates is doing to the Speaker. They ran on doing that to Nancy Pelosi, and I said, you can't give your vote to her for Speaker unless you get some concessions from her, and they refused to do that. And, then, and half the people on the uh, quote-unquote left turned on me and said that I was doing something that was crazy. This came right from the DSA handbook. This came right from AOC's own campaign. She was like, we got to have a vote on Medicare for all. So that was my ask. My ask was you don't vote for Nancy Pelosi unless they give you a vote for Medicare for all on the floor, which is what Democrats have been saying they wanted for two decades, if not longer, since Nancy Pelosi actually in 1994 said she wanted that. So I'm like, this is something everybody agrees on on the left. So let's they wouldn't do it. Matt Gates is not only doing that, he's not only challenging, but he's actually 
actually asking for reforms that progressives should be cheering for. He wants to have single item bills voted on. You don't want to put school lunches in with a border and Ukraine funding into the same bill. And that's garbage. And he wants that. And he's going to he's willing to get rid of McCarthy for that. I got to tell you, it was really inspiring to listen to his speeches. And I realized that, oh, that's why they've made him into be such a monster. And now they're literally calling him a terrorist for doing that. And they're <laughs> trying to make it look like somehow he's a maniac and he's he the the, Dem- the Republicans are out of control and chaos. That's exactly what someone's supposed to do. And Matt Gates, I don't think he takes PAC funding and he raises most of his money through two hundred dollars or less donations. And that's why he's able to do this. And it's like I don't agree with probably most of his politics, but I agree with him doing this, him getting those reforms in the House. That's what lefties should be screaming for. And uh, it's gr- it's really great what he's doing. He, he's made a fan out of me anyway. And I love his anti-war stance. Now, the only thing I hope he doesn't pivot and be pro-war on China, but his w- th- doing this to stop the funding for Ukraine is a definite winner for him. And the American people are coming around to his point of view. So I think it's great as a progressive and a lefty. I wish that the Democrats, the progressives had half the nuts that he does <laughs> because he's really, oh, it was just, it was sweet. I was just pumping my fist and cheering <laughs> this guy on. And, and Matt Gates <clears throat> tweeted out that he's willing to give some concessions on the motion to vacate to raise the threshold, making it harder in the future, if they enact Ro Khanna's reforms. <laughs> so he's shouting out a Democrat. Ro Khanna says, you can't, you can't trade stocks in Congress, 12, 12 year term limit, and no lobbyists and PAC money donations. And uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's when, uh, you know, we're driving in the car, Luke is, uh, I'm, I'm in the passenger seat, Luke's sitting in the back, and he goes, uh, Kevin McCarthy's been removed. And I was like, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on, hold on. I, I pull up Twitter, and I'm like, no, I think I think they're saying they may have the votes for now, but it can still reverse. And he's like, no, he's removed. And then I see the video, and I press play, and it's like, the yeas have it, the motion oh to vacate. And I was like, <laughs> I lost it. I just, I'm like dead silent. And then I'm, I just, this is history. The first speaker to be removed. And the issue is, if the Republicans made this big hubbub about 2022 and winning a majority, and once we do, we'll control the budget, we'll do these things. But Kevin McCarthy is unwilling to actually work with the people who got him that majority, and in fact is just trying to work backroom deals, particularly to get funding for Ukraine. <laughs> then what's the point of, 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 of voting for these individuals if in the end all Matt – look, I'm sure Matt Gates and I will disagree on, on a lot of policy positions, um, like you know Jimmy was mentioning. But if the core of his fight is reforms in Congress – then I think he's going to have 80% of the country agreeing with him if they know what's actually going on. I'm going to ask this question, and I want you to get the question I asked last night. I want to ask you tonight, and I want you, I want you to give me a rebuttal. Gallup poll comes out, right? Republican uh, Americans trust Republicans and economy 53 to 39. Highest exchange, you know, difference between the two ever, okay? They trust Republicans for military. They trust Republicans for economy. They trust Republicans... For almost everything, right? Uh, uh, everything was them trusting Republicans. By the way, we haven't had this. If you have the chart, Rob, to pull it up. Since when? If you've seen this, it's not something that's normal. You know, for the longest time, they trusted Democrats. If you look at the blue and the red, look at this uh, exchange on what's happened. It's very high and where we are today, right? It's just a number we're not accustomed to seeing. And uh, purple, the people that no difference, no opinions, going lower and lower and lower, which means people are having more and more opinions of what they want to do. So yesterday, there's certain people that say, Jimmy or Tim, they'll say, well, look at the Republican Party. They're in shambles. They're not united. This is why Democrats will always win, because no matter what happens, a Bernie Sanders will set aside to protect and get behind Joe Biden. And he'll get up there and try to convince the, the Ilhan and, 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 and you know AOC, we got to support him because we're going to get some things done. But no, we wanted you, Bernie. And Elizabeth Warren steps aside and Amy steps aside and the great Pete Buttigieg steps aside and all these guys <laughs> step aside. Right. And then you're, you're probably good Republicans, man. They can't even get along. And then even something, you know, Trump say, why can't these guys all get along together? So there is different messaging from different people. An open-ended question. What do you say to the people that are saying, listen, Matt kind of just broke apart the Republican Party just because of eight people were not happy with McCarthy? Maybe. Maybe it is that right now what Matt Gates has done will, will create the image of disunity and scare the people who finally turned around. But I'll tell you what I actually think. I think the reason you're seeing the Republican Party go up is because of Matt Gates. That's right. Because there have been... For the longest time, for my entire life, 
Congress has been a waste of time, and I didn't even vote. I voted for Obama. I regretted it because he blew up a bunch of kids. And then you get 2012 and 2016. I didn't vote for anybody. 2020, I turned around. I said, okay, maybe I want to start supporting some of these guys. 80, Gallup's latest poll, 82% disapproval in Congress. And Thomas Massey, I think he's a good guy, but he stands up there and gives this passionate, impassioned speech about how if we vote to remove McCarthy, this institution will fail. I bust out laughing. I'm like, you think 82% disapproval is an institution we want to preserve? <laughs> I'm wondering if the reason people are now actually saying I, I trust Republicans more is because they're hearing something that actually aligns more so with what they're looking for at the very least. If it is Matt Gates saying, I want reforms and no more politics as usual, no more revolving door BS, no more lobbyist money. Yeah, OK, I'm behind Republicans for that, if that's what it is. That being said, Kevin McCarthy actually creates problems, in my opinion, for someone who wants to support the Republican Party, because as soon as they get their majority, what does he do? He starts playing politics as usual once again. The only thing keeping me interested is Matt Gates. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. The, the, this idea that somehow you're supposed to have party unity and that, the, you know, AOC was bragging about it, that, oh, the Democrats are running like a well-oiled machine. Well, you're not supposed to. You're sp you were sent there to oppose the establishment inside the Democratic Party. And, of course, they're acting like that wasn't what they were sent to do there. But it is what they're sent to do, which is why her approval ratings are in the shitter, too. So uh, they're not – this is exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And the only people who are anti-war are, are – are people on the right in the Republican Party. And I, I, as a lefty, I got nowhere to go. It's just like, I got to, so it's, it's, again, just to reiterate, it's great what Matt Gates is doing. So that's why he's going to be slimed and smeared in the corporate press up and down. He's going to be called everything from a pedophile to a terrorist to yep. a white supremacist. Yep. That's the game. And so we got to be aware of it. And uh, I, I stand in solidarity with his reforms in Congress. And I think most of the American people, they want to get PAC money out of there. They want to have single issue voting. They want to have more power to the, uh, to the members and less power to the speaker. And they want to stop the funding of Ukraine. And so it, it doesn't matter if it's Nancy Pelosi or Kevin McCarthy. They're going to get that funding for Ukraine. They're going to get the bidding done of the donor class. And so that's what Matt Gates is standing up to. And I thought that the lefties would stand up to it, Bernie Sanders and, and the squad. Of course, they didn't. In fact, they all voted for the largest upward transfer of wealth in human history. They all voted for funding this Ukraine war instead of funding the United States. They rolled over completely to be in the establishment, and that's what the Democratic Party is, in lockstep with the corporate media, in lockstep w uh, with the donor class and the establishment. And I think people maybe are waking up to it, and that's why th those numbers are happening like that. So I, I really can't say uh, more about I, I always thought this was going to happen from a lefty, and it's coming from <laughs> Matt Gaetz. By the it's way, great. as a lefty yourself, what, what is it making you think about your next vote? Because you have a voice. You're, you're sure people listen to what you have to say, and you're very passionate, and you break things down, and you're a true believer. You come across as a guy that's like, listen, I'm a regular guy that just got a lot of opinions right and here's what i'm going through what do you think what are you grappling with yourself as your for your vote in 2024 well uh i was um thought i was going to support cornell west but I, i'm not going to support i can't see that happening now he's in bed with the same establishment people he's got peter dow who's a cancer on the left uh, in charge of his campaign which is why he's flailing and uh, he just left the green party so he's not going to get ballot access so he's not really running for president and that was clear to me when he came on my show he didn't ask for my vote he didn't ask for the votes of the people who watch my show in fact he looked like he was he just came on to pick a fight with me and uh and and he can't stop saying that Joe Biden is the lesser of two evil oh. with Donald Trump. So if you say that, you're undermining your own campaign, which led me to believe he's not really running. So I am looking forward to Bobby Kennedy uh, declaring his independent run because uh, a lot of the stuff he says is really important to me, like his uh, his stance on COVID, lockdowns, authoritarianism, and free speech. And, you know, he says, if you don't have free speech, you don't have democracy. And that's true. This idea that voting for Democrats, though democracy's on the ballot, your democracy hasn't been on the the ballot since 1980, okay? Your court, your <laughs> government was taken from you by corporations decades ago, and when are people going to get pissed off about that? The guys on January 6th weren't overthrowing the government. They were just protesting an election, just like the other half of the country protested for four years and said another country stole our election. They were saying it was stolen by people, and they say, you know, oh, they were trying to, over that's what Cornel West came on my show, and he said, oh, they were trying to uh, 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 overthrow the government and, uh, and upset the tr peaceful transfer of power. Really, a bunch of Second Amendment gun nuts wanted to go overthrow the government and they forgot their guns. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Oh, I thought I'd written it down. Mittens, water. Yeah. I forgot the guns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
So it, it's and now look what they're doing. So they're criminalizing their political opponents. That's what they're doing to Trump. They know he's going to win the election, so they're going to make him a criminal. And his that's what January 6th was about. That's why there were so many FBI agents in the crowd, and they pushed those people into their into the Capitol to, so they can set up this narrative and they could make. And now they're using the RICO statute to prosecute Trump. A RICO statute, which was uh, invented to go after the mafia. Not only are they using it against their political opponents. Uh, 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 Donald Trump, they're also using it against the people who are protesting Stop Cop City. So it doesn't matter if you're Donald Trump or if you're a lefty uh, protesting the expansion of the police state, they're going to use the same RICO laws to go after you because the establishment criminalizes their opponents, so no matter if he comes from the right or the left, and that's the game that's being played, and I'm trying to wake people up to that, and not that I'm going to vote for Trump or I'm a Trump fan, but uh, I can notice what they're doing to him, they're going to do to anybody who stands up against the establishment. That's the game now. That's that's what they did to Lula. That's what they did in Pakistan. That's what do do that. So there's, you know, the whole world, and I, I hope you guys know that it's only run by a handful of billionaires, right? It's, and there is no, there is no loyalty to a country. The people who, just just like Ned Beatty said in that movie Network in 1974, there are no countries. There's only companies and the international flow of dollars, and you can't upset that international flow of dollars. And if you do, you have to atone. And that's where we're at. These guys don't care what happens to America. They'll fund a war everywhere in the world before they fix the pipes or fix the infrastructure or give health care or education to anybody in the United States. And that's because we're won by globalists like Bill Gates. Bill Gates, who runs the WHO, right? So he's the biggest funder of the WHO. It goes China and then Bill Gates. They And then, so now I can't go on YouTube and contradict the WHO. And that's coming direct from Bill Gates. So he has a, a monopoly on information flow. And uh, that's the real game being played right now. It's not about countries. It's about a handful of billionaires at the WEF. Guys like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, they're running everything. Thing, and the people in Congress are just doing the bidding of those people. And that's why when Matt Gates stands up and says something, it shakes the world and they have to make it seem like it's bad instead of what it actually is, a real revolution that we need. Jimmy, I, I always wonder why you hold back your feelings. Like, why do you like, you should let it rip, you know what I'm yeah. saying? You should let it rip. Go ahead, Tim. Do you guys see you see what they're doing to Trump in New York City now? Oh, it's horrible. Uh, this, 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 this fraud lawsuit, I'll give you the breakdown of my, my prediction. The first thing, the judge summarily rules that Trump overvalued his properties. It's clear Clearly not true because Mar-a-Lago is not worth $18, 18 million. million. That's crazy. From the ocean to the lagoon, Mar Martulago, it's it's 17 and a half acres in an area where 0.3 goes for $10 million. And they're saying 17. No, it's a lie. But here's the game. You summarily decree Trump's properties are worth less than he declared. Therefore, he committed fraud. Now, the trial is, did Trump falsify records? Well, if they've already determined that his $500 million property is only worth $50 million, any record he created asserting the value of that property or a bank did, they're going to say is falsified, therefore fraud. They're going to rule that Trump is found liable for fraud against the state of New York. They're then going to say, you now have to pay us $250 million. We'll start with that building on Fifth Avenue that you claim was worth $500 million. It's worth $5 million. You now owe us $245 million. What I think they're going to do is by arguing his buildings are worthless, they can seize them in the lawsuit while making him basically drain the entirety of his net worth. So uh, the reason I bring this up is you mentioned the billionaires ruling the world. They're trying to make Trump not a billionaire anymore. Right. They're to de de destroy his assets, mm -hmm. destroy uh, the part of the uh, prosecution is not necessarily to put him in jail, though I do think they want him there. They want to drain his resources, time and energy so he can't campaign. That's what they did to Ralph Nader, right? They kept him. So they kept him off the ballot and they kept him spending money on lawyers and being in court. And so he couldn't really run for president. Let me can I ask you about um, Maybe you probably know more about it than me. So this deal that they're they're trying to prosecute him on now. So he they said he inflated the value of his building so he could get a loan, right? So he got the loan. He's paid it back. The people who gave him the loan made money off that loan. There is no aggr aggrieved There's party. No There's no victim here. It's, it's, Am I right about this? I think I think what they're trying to do is exploit the fact that the people in New York struggle to own property. And I mean this, I'm not trying to be mean to the people of, of New York who can't afford to buy, but for those who've never been through the process of buying property, it may sound like it makes sense. Oh, Trump claimed his building was, was worth more than it really was, so the banks would give him more money. No, no. When you try to buy property, the bank tells you to shove it. Yeah. We're going to appraise the property right. and tell you if you're, and, and, and see, because we have, a, we have our own responsibilities to our, our bank members. The idea that Donald Trump went to the bank and said, this uh, $10 million property, ooh, it's actually $100 million. Give me $100 million. And they'd be like, sure thing, buddy. We, we, we will believe you. And then we'll hold on to a dead asset that's worthless. No, never going to happen. And on top of that, 
The judge ignored testimony from the lenders who said, not only are these properties worth what they're worth, but we made a lot of money from it and we're happy. Yeah. And now the funniest thing is when the judge ruled Mar-a-Lago is only worth $18 million, I just, I just imagine what it must be like being a real estate agent in Palm Beach, because now you've got people coming up, coming up to you and being like, no, nah, Mar-a-Lago is worth $18 million. That means that that $30 million property trying to sell is only worth you know $300,000. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. dude. And have you seen that judge? Have you guys seen that judge? Uh, what was it uh, uh, Arthur Edward Angoron? Joe. He, first of all, you want to, t- uh, I think Rob has it, the camera, they're showing Trump, and you just see Trump just in anger, furious mode, and then Jimmy, the camera goes to the judge, he takes off his glasses, and he's like, <laughs> he's pulled, did you see that video? Yes. And then, and then he's on another longer video where they clip where he says, verbatim, he goes, I know this is going to be controversial because I know I'm being recorded, but he goes, you know, if there's a jury, even though this isn't a jury case, this is who he is as a character, he goes, listen, if I'm in a case and the jury doesn't agree with me, I could, you know... I can make my own decision, overrule them on my emotions. Rob, can you show this clip? Rob, Pat, is that cool? Yeah, go for yeah, it. Yeah, go ahead. Listen to this guy. Taped. <laughs> Juries get it wrong a lot. That's my own opinion. I do only civil trials, personal injury cases, contract disputes. But I've had situations where, like, oh, my, <laughs> my heaven's sake. How could they have thought that? <laughs> the judge. Well, I have a... Um, I have a tool that I can deal with that. It's called jury notwithstanding the verdict, judgment notwithstanding the verdict. I can say there is no possible way that a reasonable jury would have reached that conclusion. That, like that, and, think about uh, that's that's the judge. That's and then uh, he's, not, ju- he's not wrong though. No, he's not wrong. Judges can do this. No, hundred percent. But and, but I mean, like, how is it fair if that's the judge? And then uh, uh, Letitia James, the Attorney General of New York, she has said in an interview, she was like, "I have no personal vendetta against Trump. I never campaigned uh-huh. against him." And guess what? There's a fo- there's a whole long footage of her over and over and over campaigning against him, talking crap about Trump in the streets. So it's like it's not fair. By the way, do you have all. the clip? Do you have the clip for? Uh, Hillary Clinton, what she said. I'll read this to you. Hillary Clinton said, back. there needs to be a formal deprogramming of the Trump cult members. <laughs> Hillary Clinton called for the formal dro- uh, deprogramming of the Donald Trump MAGA supporters, characterizing them as a part of a cult. Maybe they don't like migrants. Maybe they don't like gay people or black people or the women who got the promotion. At work, they didn't. Clinton describes Trump as an authoritarian populist who connects with a portion of the problem base on an emotional, psychological level. Can you go ahead and play this clip? Wonderful clip by Hillary. She um, partisans in both parties in the past. Uh, and we had very bitter battles over all kinds of things, gun control and climate change and the economy and taxes. But there wasn't this little tail of extremism waving, you know, wagging the dog of the uh, Republican (laughs) Party as it is today. And sadly, so many of those extremists, those mega extremists, um, take their marching orders from Donald Trump, who has no credibility left by any measure. He's only in it for himself. He's now defending himself in civil actions and criminal actions. And when do they break with him? You know, because at some point, you Even know, the maybe there needs to be a formal deprogramming of the cult members. But something she needs laughs. to happen. And how do you but, but here's the question, old. though. Here, here's the right. question I got for you. So the only reason CNN would put Hillary Clinton to give this insight is because they think their audience would react to it, right? Yep. You wouldn't bring a guest and give them, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, like, the host is laughing as if you're supportive of what she is saying. You only bring it because you think Democrats are still influenced by her. Does she still have that kind of influence over the Democratic voter? I think the Democratic Party is a cult. Uh, you t- I call it blue and on. And uh, <laughs> so that, that, that's what that's exactly called. Uh, if you f- know about anything about Carl Jung, that's classic projection right there is what she's doing. She's talking about someone else being in a cult. No, they're the ones who are actually stalling out the military industrial complex. And right now, people like Matt Gates are calling out the corruption in Congress. What she's talking about is that they, they all agree on corruption. We agreed on having the uh, financial services screw over uh, people on their credit cards. She signed off to have 35% interest rates. She's the one who's the enemy of the worker. She's the one there for every war possible. She's the one that keeps health care away from people. She, The extremists are those people, and she, again, has to project that onto other people. Uh, and and then they, she's the one who invented Russiagate, right? So Russiagate was 100% hoax. That was proven by Mueller and then by the Durham report. It was all, they, They're the ones who financed Russian disinformation, which is what the Steele dossier was. Where did Christopher Steele 
Steele get that information? He got it from his contacts inside the Kremlin. They put it in the Steele report. That's 100% Russian disinformation. Nobody talks about it. They lied that they funded it for a whole year. They lied to the FBI. They never have to go to jail for it because they're lying at the behest of the establishment. And they got to get rid of Donald Trump because Donald Trump wouldn't do the interventions they wanted. He ran on pulling us out of the Middle East. They can't have that. He said there was a deep state, and he gave away our foreign policy. So that's what this is all about. They, Of course, the Republicans and the Democrats, they agree on all the important things to screw over regular people and keep the military-industrial complex going because they work for their donors. That's another version of her deplorable speech. And yeah. how did that work for her? Donald Trump beat you in an election after you called half the country deplorables, and she's trying to do that again. So I have a question for you guys. Uh, we we have Hillary Clinton here saying that there needs to be deprogramming, what people are referring to as essentially re-education. The former president has been uh, indicted. I think he's facing 91 charges. It's yeah. going to put him in jail for hundreds of years if he's convicted. They're trying to seize his assets and his property and destroy him. The Capitol Police are setting up offices around the country. They've raided the homes of even innocent people on accident. We are seeing the FBI now label Trump's followers as extremists to yes. be targeted. And my question is, when you see these things happening, plus the indictment of lawyers for the former president, the sanctioning, I don't know how many people know this, many of the, the lawyers that were hired by Donald Trump and his, and his, and his, uh, uh, his cir inner circle in 2020 to argue on his behalf over the 2020 election, they've been sanctioned to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars for simply providing a constitutionally, in my opinion, required legal service. What comes next? They're going to they're, they're calling Trump supporters, Trump's followers, terrorists and extremists. They're she's going on TV saying they must they're a cult that must be reprogrammed. They're arresting lawyers. Mike Cernovich tweeted recently, perhaps hyperbolically, perhaps a little bit aggressive, that in, in the coming year, if Biden wins something to the effect of he will be framed by the regime for a crime that they will use just to, do, to justify killing him. And then you have, of course, Scott Adams several years ago said it's very likely that in the next year you will be dead. Well, we're all still alive. But some people didn't make it. Crime is getting bad. And so I'm wondering if Scott Adams and Mike Cernovich are seeing something legitimate. Maybe their statements are a little aggressive. But my view is uh, uh, Hillary Clinton adding to the conversation. We need to reeducate these people. The FBI report. I'm curious what you guys think happens next considering all this. Well, I, I heard there's a split inside the military uh, in the CIA, right? So there's uh, General Flynn and uh, who... who uh, they've again, they've tried to make him out to be a criminal. They framed him to get him uh, to go along. So this is this is what they're doing. So I hope that there's a big faction of the military or some big faction of the CIA that doesn't want to go along with what's happening. I I have I've heard that I don't have any direct information, but I've heard people say that that I trust. But I don't know. I don't have wait, any I, evidence I, of it. Wait, 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 real quick. Like I. I, everyone makes the meme about me saying civil war, but I had not heard about the military having a potential split. No, I'm just saying that they back Trump and they back. They right. see what they see what the game that is being played. Hey, this is exactly what they said. What Trump made Trump a fascist was that the, he criminalizes his uh, political opponents. That's exactly what they're doing. Of course, just like Hillary Clinton, that's all the back. Just like what they're saying is happening in Ukraine. The exact opposite is the truth. Whatever you're hearing on the corporate news, the exact opposite is the truth. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, so I don't know what it's the only so i hope this is true what i'm hearing i hope the reason why trump is running is to try to run against the cia and this military industrial complex i hope that's what's happening because that's what we need to have happen and we live in a banana republic right now they're really doing it it, it does like i said it doesn't matter if you're trump it doesn't matter if you're maga it doesn't matter if you're ultra lefty they are also doing it to black socialists they're also doing it to stop cop city they uh, barack obama in 2011 signed the ndaa section 1021 which got rid of habeas corpus. So well, that means that they can throw you in jail and they don't have to charge you with the crime. All they have to do is say you're a terrorist. Well, if you go out and protest, they're going to say you're an economic terrorist. Or if you protest an oil well, they're going to say you're an, uh, you're an environmental terrorist. So they, all you do is say you're a terrorist, they throw you in jail, and that's that. And look what they're doing to Julian Assange still right out in the open. And so that's, the, and that's why none of the journalists ever tell the truth about Ukraine. That's why they never tell the truth about what's going on, because they know what's going to happen to them if they 
actually put a hurt on the establishment, which is why we have horrible journalism in America, which is why shows like this are popular, shows like Tim and mine, Joe Rogan, Rusty Rockets. That's why these shows, and, T- and Tucker Carlson's killing it. Why? Because And Tucker Carlson got fired. People do <laughs> He didn't get fired for lying. That's the kind of thing. <laughs> they, he got fired because he started telling the truth about foreign policy, economic policy, and the uh, big pharma. And as soon as he did that, he became persona non grata, and they had to get rid of him. He got fired for telling the truth, not for lying. And that's what happens. And that's what they did to Julian Assange. That's what they did to Edward Snowden. So they, they and that's why they have such control on us on YouTube. And we have to uh, answer to billionaires because that's who runs everything. And we're living. People think we live in a democracy. It's a joke that they think we're living in a democracy. We live in an authoritarian nightmare, and now we're in a surveillance state where they don't. We're, and we're operating on a liberty view from around the 1100s. You know, the the uh, a habeas corpus was in the Magna Carta. They got rid of that, so now we're operating on a liberty view from around the 1100s, and people don't even realize it or care because people are too busy trying to make a living. And while while they instead of uh, the, them helping those people, they're taking that money, sending it to the military industrial complex via v- U- Ukraine. That's a, it's a crazy world we're living in, and I wonder when the real revolution is going to start because the truckers let the template for that. So what the truckers did was they shut down capitalism and they put a hurt on them, so they immediately called them white supremacists, Nazis, as they're literally funding Nazis themselves, and they are in bed with Nazis. That's what. So if somebody in America comes up with a plan on how to do that, to get, and if it comes like from a Christian Smalls who knows how to bring left and right people together and oppose the establishment like he did on Staten Island with Amazon, so if the, and the truckers get together with a union leader like that, and they can start making demands and, and hook up with like a Matt Gates inside of Congress, that's when a real revolution has happened. That's the only thing that's going to save this country at this point. And, and Tim, can I ask you one question, Tim? Off the the FBI creating the MAG extremist category for Trump uh, extremists, what's their criteria to find out and label you and put you in that group? Like, how, what, how, what's the FBI going to monitor? Like, if you have the flag on your truck, are they going to come after you? Because, Jimmy, you nailed it. On January 6th, uh, the chief of Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, told everybody. They wouldn't let him testify. He was like, I was begging for for help. They didn't give me shit. I wanted the National Guard. Just like you said, FBI, Ray Epps, everybody getting, getting, they caused all this thing, and now they're warning us. I think cause, because they know something is going to happen for this election, now they're going to go after anybody that has any type of say, but I want to know, what do you, what do you this, think is going to be their trigger to go after you? Like, what? If you just say, hey, I like Trump, they're going to monitor your ass? So- sounds like it. I, I refer to things like this, like uh, I call it a Chinese finger trap problem. Yeah. In that uh, the establishment is panicking over the likes of Matt Gates, uh, anti-establishment podcasters and individuals. And so when none of the propaganda is working anymore, none of the media narrative is working, they go for the brute force method. But guess what? The harder you pull in a Chinese finger trap, the tighter it becomes. Mm-hmm. So when they make moves like this, I have to wonder, I'm like, are they that stupid? Because if you've got a bunch of people who are concerned the government's spying on them and persecuting them, and then you publicly announced, like, actually, we're totally doing that. Yeah. The only thing it results in is more destabilization. I'm not, uh, you know, looking at what comes next, I don't think uh, uh, people often look to uh, tropes in history, TVs, and movies, and that's wrong. They make assumptions. You know, we hear, uh, you know, Alex Jones yell, 1776 will happen again. Yeah. And I'm like, that that wasn't the start of the American Revolution. The American Revolution, uh, re- revolutionary period started in 1764. It was 11 years before the first shot was fired. 11 years. And you know what the founding fathers were doing for those 11 years? They were pamphleting. They were going around and they're kind of doing what we're doing. They're saying freedom, liberty, the oppression is wrong. The founding fathers did not want to go to war. They kept writing strongly worded letters to the crown being like, we deserve representation. And then what happened was, I'll give you a super simplified version of it. The, 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 it was the, the T Act. I'm probably getting the name wrong. They, uh, the Crown was trying to subsidize the East India Trading Company, which was on was facing dire straits. So they said, we're going to make it easier for them to sell tea in the colonies and around the world, which directly competes with the tea from the colonists, which is going to hurt their ability to make money. So the colonists got mad. They throw the tea in the, in, the, in the bay, and they're like, screw your tea. You can't do this. The Crown then says, you got to pay back all the money for that damaged tea. Massachusetts then says, screw you. The Crown then says, we're sending in regulars to maintain order in the Massachusetts colony because y'all are acting a fool. A bunch of farmers outside of the city proper in the more rural area said, you have no authority over us. The regulars were then instructed to go take the guns away from these men. And I think it was only a small group of individuals at Lexington and Concord. When the regulars came and said, you're going to give us all of your guns, they said, no, we're not. 
No one knows exactly who shot first. I think, based on what I read, it was probably an American colonist to open fire, shooting a regular. And that was the shot heard around the world. Not literally, but that's the moment they call it the shot heard around the world, which started the American Revolution one year before the Declaration of Independence. What I see happening now in Philadelphia, in California, absolute destabilization. When you got 100 people running through the streets, smashing windows, stealing products, and looting for no reason— just because these flash mobs keep happening. What's starting to happen is that these individuals view the state and law enforcement as a joke. The way I explain it to people, imagine if a bunch of clowns, literal clowns with big poofy red hair and clown noses walked up to your door, banged, and showed you a, a, a clown portrait and said, this clown portrait gives us the right to enter your property and search everything. You'd laugh, right? Yep. You'd say, what, what is this, a clown? Now, when we see law enforcement with a warrant, we are socialized to be like, this is the norm and these are the rules and we have, to, we have to obey them. But when you see people ransacking businesses, it's because in their mind, when they see a cop, they see a clown. They do not see that person as someone with authority over them at all. When this destabilization starts happening, it'll happen and it's happening all over the place with, with, with riding. What you're seeing is that kids growing up today, these younger kids are teenagers, they're young adults, do not view the United States government in any capacity as having authority over their lives. What happens then? In New York, when the riots got crazy, what did the city government do? They do what governments always do. They circle the wagons around themselves and they leave you high and dry. Yep. When these things start happening, you get men and militias forming, which is what you see in the likes of Lexington and Concord. What I see happening next is a potentiality I don't know for sure. If you look at what happened with the Bundy Ranch incident now almost 10 years ago, when the federal government starts circling the wagons around itself over the conflict and the crisis, determining that Trump's voters are all, are all extremists and terrorists, eventually law enforcement shows up to a small town for some reason or another, and some local guys who are in their 30s with body armor and guns say, we don't recognize your authority, we don't care for your authority, you don't protect us, we don't pay you, you have no authority here. In fact, what ends up starts happening is, a local person will declare themselves a sheriff, they'll vote on it, and then they'll say, we're the authority here, not you. Now you have governments at odds with each other. Civil war is not, people make this mistake. They think it's that there's going to be a big faction of states. They stamp a paper and say, we hereby declare civil war. And that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that as the government loses control because people no longer view them as the monopoly on violence, factions start popping up. Then the government circles the wagons around themselves. And then you have multi-factions, multiple factions in various parts of the country. We've already seen this start with things like Chaz Chop or otherwise. Yep. Even Stop Cop City are people saying we don't recognize the authority of the government. If this persists and the government makes the problem worse by calling Trump supporters terrorists. They are outright telling you, you are not protected by us. You are not a part of us, but we will take your money and use it against you. This kind of shit freaks me out. <laughs> so that, that and my theory is that they, they this whole th thing game by the establishment, the oligarchy through their corporate media is to keep us distracted and hating our neighbor and blaming our neighbor and being afraid. We got to be afraid of white supremacy. We got to get after we elected a black American uh, president twice in a row. All of a sudden, racism is going crazy. We got to worry about white supremacy all of a sudden. And so and your neighbors are white supremacist and your neighbors are uh, uh, QAnon and your neighbors this and your name. And they want us to be hating each other and fear each other because if we don't we'll join together and we'll see the game that's actually being played on us and that will happen what he just described a lot sooner when we don't see the legitimacy of the government governing us because they're governing for the donor class and not for us and so that's why they got to keep us distracted hating that's why they got a Hillary Clinton on CNN saying we got to deprogram MAGA they're the, the real threat the real threat is, as we all know is the government and corporate America that's the real threat <laughs> and, and you know what I think I see happening is when you get, uh, we've already seen videos since the 2020 riots where there, there's one video where a car's driving by and you see like three guys with AR-15s and body armor at the end of their block. And these are probably just local dudes who knew each other who said, guys, these riots are bad. Let's go stand, watch, and make sure nobody comes onto our street and screws with our friends and family. That's how it begins. Eventually, they're a neighborhood watch or they have a name. They need a way to recognize each other. Now there's too many members and they're like, well, let's give ourselves, you know, like a, a code so that we know who's, who's, who's helping protect the neighborhood. They're going to have other neighbors, the divide you're talking about, Jimmy, where you might have like some guys who are uh, Black Lives Matter activists. But then what's going to happen is the BLM guys in their neighborhood are going to be like, look, all we want to do is make sure our kids are OK and nobody's coming and screwing with us and we don't trust the police. And then these other guys are going to be like, yeah, they called us terrorists. We don't like them either. Yeah. And that's when you get multiple factions and they're all pointing at the government. Let me put it this way. If BLM is saying police are bad, abolish the police, they oppress us. And now the feds are going after Trump supporters as terrorists. You're very, very close 
to BLM and Trump supporters being like, I'll do me, you do you, let's not fight each other, but those people hate us. <laughs> yeah. Well, and how do you deprogram these people? Because you, you, you said a unique word over there. You said, this is also called re-education. I, I hate yeah. to break it to you, Hillary Clinton. You're not going to convince these guys to vote for you. I don't know what reprogramming and deprogramming even looks like for someone like that, but these are some of the same people that would have voted gladly for Bernie Sanders in 2016. If he wasn't they cheated. do not if he wasn't want cheated. the establishment, the yep. status quo, the business as usual, typical talking head politician in there. So how do they deprogram these people? It's I never going to happen. I think the opposite's happening. I think uh, in in 2020, before 20, 2019, it's a 2020 cycle. A lot of the people that I talk to when you quote-unquote touch grass, you go out to the real world, right? You get off the internet. They were saying things like, I'm in an Uber, and the guy's just like, I'm sick of Trump. I'm sick of the division. If we just if we vote for Biden, it goes away. And I'm, I'm telling them, like, you know, Trump's not the cause of this. He's a symptom of it. And so what I'm seeing now, and uh, it's a story that I've been telling. I, I was hanging out at the poker tables in uh, Charleston, West Virginia. And you get, you get some people, it's, it's a mixed area, actually, in the eastern panhandle. So I get one guy recognizes me and says, you think Trump's going to win, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I think might take his name off the ballot in one state, and then who knows what happens. One guy chimes in and goes, I hate Trump, but man, this stuff's freaking me out. They shouldn't be doing this. And so what I'm, what I'm hearing now, and I've heard this a couple times, so it's very anecdotal, is that typically the people who would say Trump's the cause of the problem are now realizing Trump's not the president anymore, and they're not stopping and the, the persecution, the political persecution and the weaponization of government is starting to terrify the people who are begging to be left alone. The people who are begging to be left alone, I don't think will ever take up arms and go fight or, or whatever, but they'll vote and they won't vote for Democrats. I'm not saying they'll vote for Trump either. But now I think they're scared and they're starting to realize that vote for Biden didn't end the culture war. It made it worse. Yeah. And, and then so I want to ask both of you guys a question, Jimmy and Tim. So, uh, you know. A lot of people, myself included, 2020 wasn't a free and fair election with federal agencies involved, FBI, Twitter, all that stuff. Are you guys concerned? Because think about it. Trump, all these, what, 91 uh, oh, charges, all this stuff. He's still beating Biden. They know it. They're not stupid. Do you guys think, Jimmy, something's – I mean, we talked about it in the green room. Something's coming. Do you feel like something manufactured is coming? They've been warning us about a bunch of different stuff from Pandemic 2 and all this stuff. They're not winning – uh, like, is something going to happen that you guys think is going to to where they could come in and, and put all these FBI people and everybody? Yes, else? man, they, they've manufactured. So I think I, I'm under the belief that most of those Black Lives Matter protests were half manufactured by the FBI and the deep state to create a, a, a sensation of chaos to make people afraid of a civil war coming. They don't care. They A civil war is helpful to the establishment because then we're all distracted and they get to keep doing everything they want to do. So, yeah, I, I'd be afraid. I, the, the infiltrators are the FBI, the CIA, the deep state. They're the ones who are are going to probably do something. You're right. And they're going to do it. And then, they, oh, now we have to give martial law. Now we have to crack down. Now we have to do, just like they did with lockdowns. And now we already live in a surveillance state and half the country more of it's for censorship, which is just, you know, that's that old saying that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And so people aren't being vigilant now and we're giving away our free speech. We're letting journalists that are, are being prosecuted right out in the open like Julian Assange. And so, yes, they will do whatever it is. And if, it, if they need to create a Still a quasi civil war or a chaos, they're going to do it. They've already been doing it, and you're exactly right. I think people are starting to wake up. Just like St Stop Cop City, they use the same RICO statutes, the same RICO uh, grand jury that uh, prosecuted Trump. They did it to those Stop Cop City, and so people, I think, are waiting like, wait, uh, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So we all <laughs> have the same enemy. It's the government. They're using the same thing, just like you described. That's a perfect way to put it. And I hope people are waking up to that now. Uh, I hope it doesn't come to violent to civil war before people realize the game that's happening. But I really do hope people like Black Lives Matter and the people that you described are going to come together and realize, hey, uh, it's the it's illegitimate government and we need to come together. I really hope that happens. So the first thing I want to say is a civil war is an excellent opportunity for the establishment because they could destroy the Constitution. Yes. If yeah. fighting happens, it gives them an excuse. But yeah. the other thing I want to say is you look at what happened in New York with that guy who got murdered yeah. at uh, Ryan Carson. The attitude from the right is... Well, I don't know. What was that story? So uh, uh, Ryan Carson and his girlfriend, Claudia, I think her name's Claudia Morales, they're sitting on a, on a bus bench. Now, the media's reported they're waiting for a bus, but I don't believe that makes sense. A man, an 18-year-old uh, young black man walks past them almost immediately after. We have the video. Yeah, this is it, right? uh, they get up and follow him. The dude then screen, starts attack, He's pushing a scooter. I don't know what Carson says to him or, or, or but for whatever happens next. Uh, Brian Dowling, the man in the sweater, allegedly, mm -hmm. says, 
who, what, what the what the effer you're looking at, I'll kill you right now, mother effer, comes at him. Carson pushes him, stands his ground, pushes him again. Dowling slaps him. Carson pushes him, tries to run, trips, falls. Dowling stabs him three times with, a, with I believe, like a six-inch blade, mm-hmm. piercing his heart and killing him. Now, the thing about the story is, Jesus. look, yeah. this stuff happens, right? The This guy was a left-wing activist who worked for uh, leftist nonprofits, and uh, oh, that, that's, that's him dying right now. And uh, uh, the response from the right is, you reap what you sow. Sure. When I looked at stuff like Stop Cop City, we've had our complaints about what we're seeing across this country with destabilization and law enforcement targeting J6ers while the Chaz Chop was, uh, and, and the, the George Floyd Autonomous Zone, the Atlanta Autonomous Zone were largely ignored. Now we're seeing Stop Cop City actually, they're, like you mentioned, they're getting the RICO charges, they're bringing them in. When I was saying it's going to come to the point where MAGA and BLM are just like, yeah, okay, we, you do you, we do us, but those people hate us. We're at the point now where people are looking at these cities and being like, well, you voted for it. It's all you. I think we're to the point where, yo, know, Stop Cop City is not going to appear on the radar of most Trump supporters. They don't give a, sh- a shit about what's going on in, in an urban center that the left has taken has 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 run the way they want to run. So you're going to get Trump supporters focused on their areas where they want to protect their families. If it comes to the point, you know, right now a lot of people's concerns with things like Stop Cop City and these autonomous zones is that it's destabilizing. It's not good. But if we come to the point where they're calling Trump supporters extremists, and then Trump supporters circle the wagons around their areas. And then the left circles their wagons around their areas. You've got three factions. You've got the establishment, the government, and then you've got the left and the right. Mm-hmm. I don't see the left and the right fighting each other over cities. Republicans are leaving cities. They don't want to be there. Uh, more more conservative-leaning people are moving out of these cities. Miami-Dade, I think, is one of the exceptions that went red. But then you're going to – it's like, hey, that's your place. I don't, get, I don't care. The question is going to be whether or not people are dissociating themselves from the federal government. You know, how, how local it becomes if it does break out. How long How long can one be manipulated? How oh, long does it take until somebody, you said a, you said a quote, uh, uh, Tubman, before we got started. We were not live, if you want to repeat the quote. Which one? Yeah, the quote about the fact that I would have freed more slaves. Oh, uh, Harriet Tubman. Yeah. Harriet Tubman said, I freed many slaves. I would have freed many more if only they knew they were slaves. If only they knew they were slaves. Okay, so let's, let's some people you can't do anything for. Some people you can manipulate forever, right? But you can't manipulate everybody for a long time. When parents get a divorce, typically one of the parents can manipulate the kids to believe the other parent was the bad parent. And they'll get away with it for a year, three years, five years, ten years, but you can't do it permanently. Eventually, a kid's going to grow up and say, listen, I understand what you're saying. I don't fully buy into it now. I think you were wrong, Dad. I think you were wrong, Mom, on what you did X, Y, Z, right? And... It, it, the question then becomes: How many people are right now sitting there saying, "Dude, I think these guys are pinning us against each other." Well, let me let me let me point something. Out. I got this very delicious uh, vault. Phenomenal drink. You Phenomenal. How's your brain feel? It feels great, and people could probably tell I'm like talking a million miles an hour. <laughs> this black cherry delicious energy drink that you guys made has no sugar in it. Yes. Yep. So what happened to a hundred years of advertising from Coca Cola, where finally? We broke out and said, we don't want that high fructose sugar garbage in our drinks. We want something that's healthier, that's got, you know, natural sweeteners. And so you look at propaganda and manipulation. Let's go back to marketing and advertising. Coca-Cola ads across the board in every country, a dollar for a Coke. We make it affordable for everybody. And we have a whole generation that don't, doesn't want to drink soda. Somehow we broke that multi-billion dollar a year machine to propagandize us into drinking garbage. And they roll out in the 80s these artificial sweeteners, and we all buy into it. But now all of a sudden you've got a generation of people and more being like, we don't want aspartame, we don't want Splenda, we don't want high fructose corn syrup, right? Stevia is a leaf extract or monk fruit. And now, you know what's really funny is I'm seeing everybody drink these spin drifts. Have you seen them? It's, it's, it's club soda and lemon juice. It's like sugar-free lemonade. Good. We broke the manipulation. We broke that propaganda. Right. So it's possible. And maybe maybe it's 100 years. I don't know. But the most powerful propaganda machine outside of the U.S. government, I think, is these these massive uh, uh, dopamine stimulating foods and stuff that they want people guzzling and drinking. And if we can stop drinking Coca-Cola and I think especially now with conversations like this, we're not drinking the, the, the garbage of the government. 
then I think the manipulation breaks at some point. I, but you, I, know, you know where I'm going with this? D d I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jimmy. No, I just wanted to say that we eat so much crap in this country. Like, I was just in Italy, and, you know, they don't spray their their wheat with the glyphosate, right, mm -hmm. like we do. So you, if you eat pasta here or whatever, and or, or everything's got that. So corn, the way they make corn in America, right? So uh, Bobby Kennedy explained it to me on the show is that they put this glyphosate. They figured out if they genetically modified corn, you can put glyphosate on it, and it will kill everything except this corn. Ugh. So now that's what, and then corn's in everything. They put that high fructose corn syrup, even in bread, you can't get it. So that's in everything. It's in all your wheat. It's in all your bread. And so that's why we're so sick as a goddamn country. We're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. We're not getting healthier and healthier. It's because all the goddamn poisons we're eating in our food. When I worked for American Eagle Airlines, we would do de-icing in the winter. I'm at Chicago O'Hare Airport. And I'm up in this big cherry picker on top of a truck with this big hose over my shoulder and a lever I would pull and blast something called propylene glycol onto oh, these planes. God. Propylene glycol is used as an antifreeze. It has two, two formulations. One was a 50-50 water, uh, water mix, which was hot. And it was hot propylene glycol to blast the ice off. Then we would use a 100% pure propylene glycol to then keep the ice from forming. The ice are on the planes, right? They no put way. this in muffins at gas stations. Oh, what? They say it's fine for you to eat. Don't worry. And oh apparently what it does is it's this <laughs> gel. When you add it to muffins and food, it makes it seem oily. Because oh, I love that part of it. Oh. Damn you, it. When you make a cake, you put oil in it. And oh. that's what makes it gooey and delicious. And, and look, it says hey. it's recognized as by safe by the FDA. Uh, yeah, are you kidding me? How does that now, even possible? Now, hold on. You, it, it may be the case that, like, just because I use it as antifreeze on an airplane doesn't mean it's literal ethylene. I, I think it's ethylene glycol, which is you do not drink. That goes in your engine. Mm -hmm. But when I worked for American Eagle, they said, keep it off your skin, avoid contact, cover your mouth, and avoid getting large quantities on you. The FDA says it's safe, but mm -hmm. we're advising you not to get yeah. it on you. And there was even a story. One guy said that his buddy walked out of the break room and he pointed at him and just blasted him with it because oh. they thought it was safe. And I'm like, bro, they thought asbestos was safe. Yeah. Okay. Right. How many? They thought cigarettes were safe. Agent Orange. Yeah. So, but look. You I, know where I, I'm going with this, though? This this, this is the part about manipulation that I'm talking about. I think uh, all of us have been manipulated before. You have, I, I have. I got the vax. Yeah. Well, there you go. A highest level of manipulation, right? But we've all been manipulated before. Nobody is uh, free from that. Okay. We've been ripped off before. We've been manipulated. Yesterday, I'm talking to uh, PragerU's uh, CEO, Marissa Strait. She's here. She's doing a show with me. We're, you know, she's interviewing for the show. And we're just talking, hey, what do you think about what's going on in America and all this stuff? I said, what is the business model of a divorce attorney? Think about a business model of a divorce attorney. Think about a business model of a nuptial agreement attorney, what do they do? This is how it typically starts. You'll say, hey, babe, uh, you know, let's just get all this stuff on paper because I love you. You love me. Let's get on paper in case. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? I just want to make sure we're both protected. Okay, I'm game. Why don't we come up with the terms and then we go to the lawyers and then we say, this is what we agreed on. So you guys agree. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happened? You do hours of the conversation. Then you hire a lawyer. You have to have your own lawyer. She has to have her own lawyer, okay? You call the lawyer and say, how much does it cost to put a nuptial agreement? My husband and I have already agreed on all the terms. The lawyer says, oh, no more than three to $5,000. Oh, fantastic. Let's do it. Then comes the first meeting, okay? Hey, here's what we agreed on. She gives it to her lawyer. He gives it to his lawyer. Her lawyer says, um, Mary, you know... I don't mean to intrude. I know you guys have agreed on this, but this is the lowest I've seen a wife get out of all the wives <laughs> I have been doing nuptial agreements for. I, I'm not, I don't want to create cause anything, but I, I, I don't know. I think you should, you know, maybe increase this. Would you like me to bring it up to the attorney? So then the wife sits there and says what? Well, yeah, okay, sure. So then wife gives the lawyer the permission. Lawyer calls his lawyer. The lawyer's like, what are you talking about? They already agreed on this. Well, she wants more on this. Then his lawyer calls who? Calls him. Oh, God. And he says, what did she say? <laughs> and then he calls who? The wife. And he's like, what are you talking about? Well, babe, she said, no wife, da 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 I was like, we agreed on this. What are you talking about? <laughs> Fight breaks out, right? What happens behind closed doors? The entire time you're thinking your lawyer is on your side, her lawyer is on her side, but the reality of it is the lawyers are on each other's wow. side. The more conflict they create between the husband and the five, a wife, a month later, two months later, the bill comes. 
$11,728. What's this? I thought I said 30 to 5. Yeah, but I didn't think you were going to have all these other changes. You asked for another one. <laughs> I never asked for the changes. You caused it. What's going to cost 11000 this? What's the point? I think these divorce lawyer, nuptial agreement lawyers are actually the establishment. <laughs> this is the perfect analogy where they're using the parties on different sides who may differ on certain, like right now you said, I disagree with Matt Gates on this, on this, on this, but I agree with them on pa 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 pa. So what's starting to take place is on Democrats and Republicans are like, look, dude, if there's something we're both on the same side with, I'm anti-establishment. Muslims and Christians, dude, I'm against what they're doing with, you know, uh, 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 these kids, LGBTQ. I'm pro-family. I'm one of you. You cannot touch me. We're on the same page. Wait, what? Christians and Muslims, yeah. BLM and this MAGA, was a, dude, I can't stand the fact that, dude, but we're on the same page with this. Uh, families, I'm living in Chicago, you know, you're coming in to use my gym for migrants. What the hell are you talking about? This is my gym for my kids. And Republicans in Texas, we got to protect the border. I'm a Republican, you're a Democrat. But, dude, we're on the same. So what's happening, all of this manipulation, people aren't starting to realize. We're on the same page when it comes down to them forcing us what to do. I'm not for this anymore. And then what happens with the Gallup polls? It's shown what it's shown. What happens with Ukraine? We're all, but, the, but the part that's the hardest thing to do, the hardest thing to do is the lifespan of manipulation. It's the lifespan of manipulation. Is it one day? Is it one month? Is it one year? Is it 10 years? Is it 50 years? You joined a feminist movement 50 years ago and you're 68 years old. Now guess what? It's too late. Because they got you for 50 freaking years. Our job is to try to shorten the lifespan of how long we're manipulated. The shorter we're manipulated, the sooner we can be like, whoa, 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 I'm free. I see it. I see what's going on. But so the goal is for us to kind of go and say, boom. No, I get it. I see what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm not with it. That, that's the part where I see hope in both sides seeing that the divorce attorneys are trying to create a divorce in America to make more money and fees on the back end, I think the American people are starting to realize what's really going on. But I think that's fair if you were to let, take a look at someone like me or someone like Jimmy, where, Jimmy, I think you have more economically left views than I would. I'm more probably moderate, maybe, I, I would say, I, I'm, you know, I usually view myself economically a little bit to the left, but then there's someone like Luke Rudkowski, who's a friend of mine who's very, like, anarcho-capitalist free market. Yeah, I agree with you there, and I think those realizations have happened. When when Jimmy's praising Matt Gates because Matt Gates is basically challenging the establishment, that happened. But I see too many people who have millions of followers and go on social media and they make videos where they're like, "We should be at war in Ukraine," and that is the establishment. Yes. So it's not just like yeah, yeah, but they're part of the camp that's that's still manipulated. That's I, what I mean by it because people fall in different camps. They're still part of the manipulated camp. For example. You got a guy that didn't get the vaccine. Did you get the vaccine or you didn't? Did I you? didn't. No. Okay. So there's a folks that didn't get the vaccine, mm. right? There's a folks that only got one shot. I know guys that only got one of the shots of Johnson yeah. Johnson. There's guys that got two of the shots. There's guys that got the two shots and the first booster. There's guys that got the second booster, then stop. The third booster, then the fourth booster. And then there's people that are still taking all of it, right? Yeah, like yes. mm -hmm. Kelsey coming out saying, hey, get your two shots. Right? Yeah, right you're dating Taylor Swift. Come and get the but, Pfizer shot. All I'm saying is some people are continuously being manipulated. Right. Some people are dropping off. So I think what you're describing would then be, uh, it's, it's kind of a, 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 a corruption of what Andrew Breitbart had said a long time ago, but I imagine it like we, we have all jumped through the wall of fire. Uh, imagine there's a, there's, there's a fire. And there are a lot of people you're describing that are still manipulated, and they're told, if you go through that fire, you will burn. It will, be, it will be hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then some people finally break, jump through, and on the other side, they're on the beach. There's a party happening. We're all here. We, all, we disagree on a lot of things. We agree on a lot of things. We're left, right, center, you know, varying degrees of libertarian. Some people even authoritarian, but just don't like the way it's being run now. And they're arguing with us because they realize the machine's been lying. I would say that the manipulation right now is those... You can call it those in the matrix, those outside of the matrix. There are there are left wing individuals who are friends with right wing individuals and debating these ideas, and they're all called right wing because they're outside of that field of manipulation that you're describing. So I, I, I suppose we're on the side where we're having the debate and we don't know everything, but we're trying to figure it out. Many of these people are marching in lockstep with the official corporate, you know, government narrative. So when the when the manipulation on them breaks, well, we win. Right. Yeah, but but but, but you, you're thinking we have to be at 100 percent to win. We no, it's never no, like no. that. We no, have it could to, be 30 percent. It could be 20 percent. Yeah, it could 10. be 10 percent. It's it's a lot smaller. A a, 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 a organization worth three trillion dollars was founded by two guys called Apple. 
Yeah. Steve and Steve, right? It took two guys to build a three trillion dollar organization with a vision they had, and then they recruit all the other people, and the company got bigger and bigger and exactly. bigger. But the reality of it is, you don't need as many true believers as you think you need. Joe was one guy. Joe Rogan is one mm-hmm. guy, right? What do you do with his podcast? He went from being a you know, pro smoke weed, legalized marijuana documentaries. Okay, then that happened. Hey, I'm Bernie Sanders. This is what I'm doing. Okay, oh shit, Joe's for Bernie, and it's like, uh, vote Republican. Wait, what? How did you go through this evolution, right? <laughs> yeah. And then Elon Musk is saying the only way we can save it is vote Republican. It's kind of weird what's going yeah. on. But all I'm saying is, I think the, I think every one of us, whether it comes down to financially, our health. You know, either we're too lazy to want to learn for ourselves, right? Like the other day we're sitting here with Liz Wheeler and we're talking about whether LeBron James's wife ordered uh, steroids and PED and is, is she kind of using a PED, kind of like Peyton Manning's wife had the same thing and are they going to do what they did to Lance Armstrong? And then, I, you know, she's like, well, you know, do it, it's not fair that these guys are using all this stuff. I said, listen, everybody in America knows how to get a six-pack. How come we don't have six-packs? <laughs> everybody in America knows how to get a six-pack. Tell me one person that does know how to get a six-pack. Don't eat sugar. You know, don't eat BS food. Change your diet. Do five minutes of abs every day. Within 12 months, you're going to have a six-pack if you do the thing. But how come so many, so few people have six-packs? Because it's hard to do. So either we're not willing to put the work to get clarity for ourselves, or we are simply caught in the web of being manipulated for too long, and we're not free yet. You know, you know something amazing is uh, Ian Crossland, who's uh, one of the hosts on IRL, he, he weighed 127 pounds, <clears throat> 127 pounds, and uh, we were shooting a music video, and we, were, we told him, like, part of it is we're going to film it in three parts over six weeks, so we need you to work out. He's kept working out. You know why? It feels good. It feels so good. Yeah, so it's hard to start. Super likable guy. Yeah. Super yeah. likable guy. And, 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 and Pepe, just one last thing, too. And I, I, you know what I think it is, too, Jimmy? It's like the American people are so traumatized with all the stuff that we've been talking about. It's yeah. almost as if they have, like, civilian Stockholm Syndrome. And, that, and you know what it is? It's where the, the abused falls in love with the abuser. Yeah. And it's like they're so, like, attached. And, we, you know, this is my – we they can't get that, that mindset – Switched around. I mean, unlike us, these people, I, I, I think it's, I, I, I have hope, but I think that they're too embedded and too in love with the system. To Vinny, complete- do you want to publicly announce that you're joining the club of five people? I'm joining the <laughs> You want to do that or no? No, I'm not going to do it. You're I'm not going to do it? You're going to hang in there? Because we're going to go for another hour. Just another, so- uh, then I have to. Then you go yeah, do your yeah. thing. Okay, so let me go Vinny. to the next story. All right, next story, Jimmy. So DeSantis, okay, DeSantis. Ron DeSantis, we're talking about all this stuff. Some Republicans are not Trump at all. We had Ann Coulter here, lost her mind on anything good to say about Trump, and she's pro DeSantis. That's who she would like to see as a candidate. Mm -hmm. By the way, so are a lot of other people that are part of this. They're not sitting there. They cannot stand Trump, and they can't even stand thinking about the idea of voting for Trump. So Ron DeSantis jabs. Trump says he would be a lame duck president if elected. This is a CNBC story. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in a CNBC interview criticized Trump electability, stating he would be a lame duck on day one if he could even get elected. DeSantis expressed doubts that Trump's ability to address key issues, saying, I think he'd have major problems with personnel and and pointed out that Trump failed to drain the swamp and uh, make Mexico pay for the border wall. DeSantis highlighted that Trump's record emphasizing that Trump increased the national debt by $7.8 trillion dollars. During his presidency, and he said, and of course, he didn't deliver on his core promises. DeSantis discussed his strategy, noting he would emulate President Biden's approach by using the budget reconciliation process to pass his agenda. When you hear these stories of DeSantis going after Trump, what do you think about? This is going to hurt DeSantis in the polls. Why is that? DeSantis is playing a political game during a culture war. And so you look at Ukraine and you look at a lot of these issues uh, Michael Moore put it best when he said that uh, Donald Trump was the was a, the biggest collective fu in history. That he would be a human Molotov cocktail lobbed into the system. Now that's a great speech he gave. He then goes on to say, and they'll regret, they'll they'll like it for a month or a minute, and then they'll come to regret it or whatever he said. He was wrong about that last part. Ron DeSantis keeps trying to play this policy game. We love the policy. You know, I was a big, I, I was actually saying DeSantis was the guy a year and a half ago. But what he doesn't understand is the cultural issues and what gets a president elected, and it's not this. This is why uh, I just I, – he's, he's dropping the polls. Nikki Haley is now beating Ron DeSantis on Predict It. Mm-hmm. I think his campaign has been too much – has been just too <clears> – <throat> I don't know what the right word is – stodgy. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not in the, the cultural zeitgeist. It is, 
You know, he did a bunch of things that were really great in Florida. He led the country very well. I think he's, he did a fantastic job. He's our best governor. I, I was saying for a while he was the best politician in the country. Now I'd say that's Matt Gates. But Ron DeSantis is playing a game that no one else cares to listen to at this point. I think for the most part, it is sad. It breaks my heart to see all of these really great policies that he's talking about wanting to implement. But then his campaign is run like a disaster. A disaster. A complete disaster. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't have his finger on the pulse of what's going on. You know what Andrew Breitbart I like that's said. What I mean, he said what uh, politics is downstream from culture. Uh, DeSantis is a policy wonk. He probably is the best policy guy on that stage. But that's not why Americans are voting right now. They're, nobody's like delving into Trump's policy at all. They're just going with him because of his persona. They're saying we have watched the Capitol Police expand beyond D.C. into Florida, into California. We there was a woman in Alaska whose home was raided because she looked like a woman who was in the Capitol. And so they said, we're going to break into her house. You've got uh, 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 Enrique Tarrio, 22 years in prison, despite not even being there, yeah. because he, he posted a message on Parler saying, don't, leave, don't effing leave or something like that. Joe Biggs, they said he, get a terrorist, he gets a terrorist modification because he knocked over. He's accused of knocking over a metal barricade. And I'm like, dude, look, riding at the Capitol was bad. The dude should probably have time served. He's been locked up for two years over this. He walked around goofing and laughing, and, and they gave him two decades. These are the things that are freaking people out. Ron DeSantis is playing this game of, well, if you look at our policies, we've got to address these issues. Meanwhile, people are in solitary confinement, and we're going like, we need someone who's going to just scream at these people. And and I, my thing about Trump is I don't think he's going to be the best president or the best guy for the job. I can appreciate no new wars. I can appreciate his plans for withdrawal. I appreciate when he admitted American foreign policy. It was hilarious. And I think he wants revenge. And that revenge means he fires a lot of people who deserve to be fired. Ron DeSantis looks like he's going to be a guy who's going to come in and say, well, I'm going to try and get done what I can get done to benefit this country. But that means I got to play ball so I don't get kicked out or attacked like Trump does. And that's the message of the American political class for my entire life of, well, if I push too hard, they'll oust me. So at least I can get a little change here. What that basically means is I'm going to swim with the current. I'm going to go with the flow with all the school of fish. And then maybe at some point I might get lucky and add a grain of sand to, to, to the heap of change. Now, I'm not interested. I want a human Molotov cocktail. I want Donald Trump to go in and just be like, I'm firing everybody because I want revenge, whatever it is. <laughs> Whatever it is. Not bad, Tim. Great. I don't think Ron DeSantis is a revenge guy. I think he's a policy guy, and I think he's going to play ball, and he's going to negotiate, and that's not, not good for us. Pat, what are the chances that Ann Coulter, who was just here three days ago, four, is actually advising DeSantis now? Because if you look at what he's basically – DeSantis is on the offensive now. The gloves are off. He's basically calling out Trump. He wasn't doing that a month ago. He's saying he didn't drain the swamp. He didn't build the wall. You know, promises made, promises unkept. She must have said wall how many times? 65 times. Okay, so what are the so, chances uh, what, that she's advising Trump, uh, DeSantis at this point? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, DeSantis hired the worst possible campaign staff in, in the history of a president. A presidential, and it's probably not fair, but in my lifetime, I can't believe the people he hired. Uh, his, 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 his PR department effectively started attacking everyone in the most annoying and, and nails on a chalkboard way. And this caused them to lose a bunch of their support. The DeSantis campaign actually has a, an internal mandate that their people cannot appear on my show. Because we criticized Ron DeSantis. What? Not, not a joke. No, absolutely serious. People who are friends of ours, who have been on Tim Castile before, are not allowed to come on the show. We've reached out to them saying, hey, look, you know, we've had criticisms, but we, we like him as a policy guy. Come on. Nope. Won't do it. And I'm just like, then, then you guys deserve to lose. Well, okay. we have. This is a. This is the fourth time we're trying that we got a. I think third. This could be the third. I could be wrong on third or fourth time that we're getting a date on the calendar. We're gonna see if this one's actually gonna happen or not. It's in two or three weeks. Wait, wait. Gonna, so they keep canceling on you? The the weather was one issue and a couple other things, but this next one that we're gonna have is in two or three weeks. He's gonna be here. We'll see, obviously, whether that'll happen or not. Look, if, but if, his if, his guy, Brian, has reached out multiple times saying we're going to do this, and we're looking forward to having a conversation with him. So, well, good, good we'll luck see. to you. You know, for us, yeah. uh, when Ron DeSantis announced his campaign on Twitter, on X, and it crashed, and his rousing speech was, we're, we're leading the great American comeback. I said, that is the the like least charismatic announcement I've heard. Barack Obama stands in front of 10,000 people in Chicago, and he says, and that is why I am running for president. And they go, ah, and they go nuts. Trump has the elevator moment, these grand moments, and Ron missed it. You say that one time, and then all of a sudden, all of the people that support Ron DeSantis 
will just level every possible insult. We had I had a debate between Laura Loomer and Bill Mitchell on the Culture War podcast, my Friday morning show. And I asked Bill Mitchell why it was that I keep trying to defend DeSantis on, on policy and criticize him where I think he deserves it, but I think I'm being reasonable. Why am I being called an effing moron piece of trash? Why are people... Uh, uh, like just inundating me with these nasty messages. Look, I'm a man. I don't care. You're saying it. I'm telling you it's hurting your campaign. And his immediate response was, well, Laura, Laura Loomer posted a picture. I said, stop. I don't care about Laura Loomer. I'm, I'm this middle of the road guy who liked DeSantis. I am saying I, I have some legitimate criticisms of him right here. Here's why I like him. Yeah. Why are you insulting me? And he goes, well, Alex Brusowitz. I'm like, there it is. You lost. You lost. It, you, Alex Brusowitz and Laura Loomer, master trolls. They are huge Trump fans. They, Laura Loomer, no one supports Trump more than Laura Loomer, and they figured it out. They, they insulted the DeSantis campaign, and the DeSantis campaign took the bait and went nuts and started attacking everyone in response. I've had people from, uh, I don't want to drag anyone else's, high-profile conservatives who have never said a bad word of DeSantis come to me and they were like, I'm getting attacked by the DeSantis people for some reason. I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's because his campaign staff are just blowing up his campaign. They want him to lose. When I have a guy with two million followers who is a fan of DeSantis, and he said all, all that all that he did was he said he, he thinks Trump's going to win based on the polls, and they just went after him, mm. insulting in every mean yeah. and nasty way. All of his surrogates, they said you're an effing idiot, just like nasty stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I think they want him to lose. That's all I can say. It's 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 the p most poorly run campaign I've ever seen. You know, can I just change the subject a little bit? You're talking about when do people start to wake up and yes. when do they stop being manipulated? When are people going to realize? So this, I've had people say to me about the Trump prosecutions, and I try to explain to them what this really is, is criminalizing the establishment's enemies. And they go, but Jimmy, Donald Trump actually did break laws. And I'm like, so you think we're supposed to prosecute Donald Trump for whatever that law is you think he broke when Dick Cheney and George Bush walked the earth, they ordered a torture program and Barack Obama was supposed to prosecute those guys constitutionally required to and he didn't and the reason why he did well the public reason why is, is he said that all those to torture crimes happened in the past and Barack Obama's looking towards the future right which uh, you know all the crimes I've committed are in the past too so I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad we're not prosecuting those but uh, the, the, the reason why he didn't for real is because he worked for the same people and Barack Obama was not a departure from George W. Bush Barack Obama took us from two wars to seven Barack Obama kicked 5.1 million families out their houses while he made sure that the bankers got their bonuses. Barack Obama deported twice as many Hispanics as Donald Trump. He built those cages they put those people in. He dropped more bombs than George W. Bush. And so they'll, and now they, remember they used to say they hated Ralph Nader because they, he gave us George Bush. Well, now they all love George Bush because George Bush called the people on January 6th terrorists. So now the establishment loves him again, but they still hate Ralph Nader. Isn't that amazing? So that that's the, what I hope people wake up to that fact that if you're going to prosecute Donald Trump, it can't be because he's breaking laws, because we already have people who are war criminals. Every president's a war criminal in my lifetime. And not only that, they ordered a torture program and Barack Obama said, yep, we tortured some folks. And then he didn't prosecute anybody for it. In fact, they put one, some, the, uh, the head of the CIA, uh, I forget her name, Haspel, and uh, they Gina put Haspel. Gina Haspel, right? And they said, oh, she broke the glass ceiling because she's the head of the CIA. Yeah, she broke the glass ceiling and then she picked up one of those shards of glass and started torturing people with it. <laughs> Barack Obama Obama <laughs> killed a 16-year-old American citizen in yeah. cold blood, ordering a drone strike which killed Abdulrahman Alalaki at a civilian restaurant in Yemen, a country we are not at war with. And when confronted, Luke Rudkowski of We Are Change confronting Obama's team at, uh, I believe it was like a DNC debate in 2012, I think it was, and the response was, he should have had a better father. Uh -huh. Barack Obama's, the, the official administrative response yeah. was, oopsie-daisy. Oopsie, oopsie daisy, yeah. you ordered a drone strike on a nation we are not at war with, a civilian restaurant with tons of collateral damage and casualties, killing a 16-year-old American. And, and, and do we get a prosecution of, of Barack Obama? No, no, no. The reason he's not going to go after Bush is because he's playing the game with That's them. Right. They work for, like you said, work for the same company. That's right. Now, that, that article you pulled up from the Intercept, I want to bring that, you can pull that one back up. Donald Trump ordered a commando raid in Yemen, one of the first acts, which reportedly resulted in the death of an eight-year-old American girl. And I'll say this, too. There should be an investigation into what happened and how this girl died. And if Donald Trump is responsible for the death of an eight-year-old American girl, I want military tribunals. I don't care. I want investigation. I want prosecution. That being said, the Obama administration definitively, we know for a fact it's been reported far and wide, and they've admitted it, ordered a drone strike that killed these people. The Trump administration ordered a, a commando raid. However, the current understanding we have is that people have asserted 
the commando raid resulted in the death of this girl. It's not as clear. I don't care. There should be an investigation of both. And if Trump is, is cleared of wrongdoing, so be it. If not, lock them all up. Well, isn't that interesting that they're not prosecuting Donald Trump for that? Exactly. <laughs> that, that, exactly. So it just goes to because they've all committed those crimes. So that's why it took them so long to impeach Donald Trump. They had to find a crime that he committed that they also didn't commit and are complicit in. And that's what, the, so that's, this is just a big game. It's an obvious, so I think people are waking up to this as a political prosecution of Donald Trump. And that's why every time he gets indicted, his numbers go up. I'll, I'll play this game. When, when, when some leftists or Democrat or whoever, liberal, neoliberal, says, shouldn't we hold people accountable for their crimes? I'll be like, I'll make a deal with you. Did you hear about how Trump killed that eight-year-old American girl in Yemen? They'll be like, no. i like, yeah, look it up. Look it up. Let's let's do this. How about we prosecute him for that? Yeah? And then when they say, sure, I'll be like, great, Obama's next. Yeah. And they'll go, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I don't want to do that. That's anymore. right. But like, Tim, oh, what's okay. the precedent for this? Because, you know, Jimmy sort of alluded to this, that during his lifetime, no president has ever not killed uh, random civilians, you know? Right. American citizens who are constitutionally protected. And Obama killed... Anwar al-Awlaki, Abdurrahman's dad. So the working theory is that Barack Obama kills Anwar al-Awlaki, admittedly saying, well, he was a jihadi. I don't care. Right. There are a lot of Americans in this country with bad opinions. You don't blow them up. Right. But, well, you know, Obama said he could do it. Why then did his 16-year-old son die? You expect me to believe that it was an accident? You blew up a civilian restaurant with this guy's kid in it? I think Barack Obama was like, I'm going to make sure all these people who, who challenge us know we'll, we'll fucking kill your kids. And that's what he did when he killed Abdul Rahman al alaki I don't, I don't believe the, 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 the narrative from the establishment. We, we made an accident. when we, It was just an, an accident when we were trying to get somebody else. Whoopsie daisy. We, whoopsie daisy. We were targeting a terror leader, and it just so happened it was the 16-year-old son of the guy we just killed. So I think this is abject evil, killing some dude's kid. The kid grew up in Colorado. He lived in San Diego. He was born in Colorado. He lived in San Diego, and he was killed by Obama administration drone strike. If you accidentally kill an American citizen, guess what? We lock you up. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to make the argument that collateral damage happens in war and we give presidents a wide mandate on recognizing that sometimes civilians die in these conflicts and it sucks, fine. I think it's bullshit. When we have the video released by Julian Assange, collateral murder, where Reuters journalists are, mm -hmm. are shot down by an Apache and killed, that the argument they give us is like, well, it was an accident, we thought they were armed and terrorists, mm -hmm. and the American people typically buy this for whatever reason. I don't. But when they kill American citizens without charge or trial, I kind of think like, hey, you know, we've got evil people running our country and they should be prosecuted. Instead... They go after Trump on BS about his lawyers argued he won an election and they filed the paperwork and they did the alternate elector slates, which had happened before in 1961. Yes. I'm supposed to care about that. I'm supposed to care about that when Julian Assange has been locked up for the That's past right. decade and they've effectively executed him. They've done it in a way where they can prevent him from being a martyr, but they've destroyed his life because he exposed their war crimes. I'm not I'm just I'm, I get stuff gets me so pissed off. Me Sorry. too. I'm right there with you. By the way, let's talk about RFK. And side note, if DeSantis... You want him on your podcast. Did you want him to go to West Virginia? Or would you go to Tallahassee to have him on? Well, I think initially we, we, we offered uh, to come to uh, Florida. We've, we've said the same thing for the Trump team as well. Because, like, come on. Like, we're not going to tell someone you have to come here. That makes no sense. In fact, we've gone to Congress tw uh, twice. I think twice. Uh, and did our show from congressional offices because we know that these guys are in the middle of a vote. They can't come, but they can run up, do the show. So you would go to Tallahassee to interview the Absolutely. Santos. Absolutely. Okay, no um, but then that, if that's the case, I think you should do your show. I think it's an it's a, a absolute must to go on your show, especially with the audience that you have. Uh, I thought maybe exactly. you wanted to come to West Virginia and the beach in West Virginia is slightly different than the one in Florida. Maybe he would have preferred you coming to Florida. Pawpaw season, though. I mean, it's a good time to come. Yeah. Pawpaws, what, do you ever have one? What's that? Uh, Pawpaw. No. What's that? Uh, Apple uh, West. It's a uh, hillbilly banana. It's uh, uh, it's like the northernmost mango family fruit, and uh, it's it's like mango and banana combined. And there there's tens of thousands of them right now, just falling everywhere. They're good. Are amazing. Oh, great. Yeah, they're amazing. And pe you you make banana like you can make pawpaw bread and stuff with them. You don't typically find them in stores because they don't last that long. Well, so, just so you know, we were going to announce right now, that was a perfect mix. The, the, the newest yeah. flavor yeah. of Vault yeah. coming out is <laughs> Pop Pop Pop. West Virginia edition. Sure going the Tim Pool with Bam. his beanie on it. So Pop Pow is pow. coming out pow, pow. here soon. Pow, Let's talk about RFK. RFK, RFK. So poll comes out. RFK Jr.'s independent run could pull more from Trump than Biden. So a recent Quinnipi, uh, uh Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac uh, University poll indicates that RFK Jr.'s uh, potential independent run for 2024 presidency could disproportionately affect Republicans rather than Democrats. Notably, the poll shows that Republicans have a notably higher favorability 
rating for Kennedy with 48% uh, uh, having a favorable view compared to only 14% on a Democrat side. So who would he take votes away from if he were to run as an independent? Well, I think definitely it would be more votes from Trump, and that's why the Democrats forced his hand into leaving the primary. They they completely were rigging it and cheating it, and they were going to start making him pay for the primary if he wanted to have one. So he had no choice but to run independent, and the reason why the Democrats wanted him to do that, they forced his hand, is because they think he's going to take more votes from Trump, and I think he will because a lot of people who want to vote for, Do- for uh, Bobby Kennedy their second choice would be Trump. That nobody's going to vote for Bobby Kennedy. Their second choice would be Biden. Nobody. So, but I think what Bobby Kennedy's actually going to do is big bring people who don't vote, which is the biggest voting block. People who don't normally vote, they're going to see a reason to vote again because the guy's really anti-establishment. And I think that uh, uh, what are the independents also, which is the second biggest voting block, are going to be drawn to him. So I think that he might take votes from Trump, but I think he's going to enter enter people who don't normally vote to come out and vote. I, I'm, I'm a little split on this one. Uh, you know, when the story came out, I actually said, I, I don't think it'll be from Trump because, uh, you know, Phil Labonte on the show said in the most uh, eloquent way that Trump's bottom is solid. He's not, uh, his, 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 his voter base at 44%, they're never going anywhere no matter what. And the poll showing that Republicans have a, have a higher favorability of RFK is true because he's anti-establishment doesn't mean they're going to vote for him. However, that being said, I hear from a lot of people that they're very, very pissed off that Donald Trump backed Fauci, uh. didn't fire him, and all the COVID stuff. And yep. if RFK's principal position is the anti-COVID stuff, Trump's still coming out and saying, you know, that he saved 100 million lives. He's told his liberal friend said this, mm. and he, he, he likes what he did. I'm like, you're, you might actually end up seeing people be like, I'll vote for RFK Jr. It's hard to know for sure. Uh, we talked with Rich Barris, the People's Pundit, and I think the general assessment was... Trump will suffer from this, but RFK will likely split more Democrats. I think that's what they're looking at. And so it may end up with a, situ- a situation where you have Biden slightly below Trump and Trump winning a state like Maine with with a, with 43 percent or something. But it doesn't, for sure, though. doesn't just show how far left the Democrats have gone. Well, you're talking about the nephew of JFK, the Democratic president, greatest of all time. Right. The son of Bobby Kennedy murdered. <laughs> right. Uh, now, 48% of Republicans identify with him. What's the number? 14% of Democrats. Hmm. He is no longer even beloved. The, the, the Kennedys are no longer beloved in the sacred de- Democratic Party. Well, He's now it's, it's, on the Republican side of things. This is crazy. I was going to say, because it's a cult. Because yes. the Democrat, whatever their favorability is, is march in lockstep. That's right. uh, RFK Jr. Was, was like moderate. He's on gun control yeah. issues, right? It, he... he, he a lot of Trump supporters are coming on being like, have you looked at him? He's a liberal. I'm like, well, of course he's a liberal. Mm-hmm. But he's anti-establishment, so now you like him? That's what it, it really is. The Democrats are a cult, in my opinion. And well, the Democrats are called in Blue Anon? Yeah. So yeah. The, you know, they, they say, say this is a big tent party. It's a big tent party. Yeah, as long as you just kind of get in line. And this is why the Republicans are so divisive, so they say, is because people have different opinions. All right, we're going to argue with Matt Gaetz, Eric McCarthy, or it's a Democratic party. All right. Bernie, Elizabeth Warren, all right, everyone get here. I'm behind Biden now, well, this, and that's just how it works. There's this weird phenomenon now that I've stayed true to what I thought used to make me a liberal and a lefty, mm-hmm. which was freedom of speech, my body, my choice, bodily autonomy, anti-authoritarianism, and anti-war. Yeah. And now all those things have been turned in. They yeah. call you a right-winger for that. If you're anti-war, you're a right-winger, you're a Putin yeah. puppet. You're in, It's the craziest thing. So it's, there's been this shift in the parties. So now when you say that the Democrats have gone farther left, I say they didn't. They've gone actually further authoritarian and establishment yes. and there's nothing left or liberal about the Democratic Party anymore. They're corporatists and they've tricked people into thinking that you're actually a liberal or a lefty if you vote for those corporatists. Jimmy, and, w- would you break that down, the four things you said that made you a classic liberal and how counterintuitive it is today? Well, it well, used well, to be... You said my body, my choice, my body, but, freedom of but speech. But that's not classic liberalism. Okay. That is Jimmy's it? talking about tri- uh, traditional liberalism. Okay. Mm-hmm. But yeah, continue. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in after. So yeah, I just always thought what made me a lefty was that I was anti-war, I was anti-authoritarianism, I was for freedom of speech, absolute, across the board, and bodily autonomy, my body, my choice. That's all out the window. Uh, the, le- the the Democrats have all flipped on all those things. Mm-hmm. They're for censorship, they're super pro-war, they're against your body, my your body, your own choice, it's your body, my choice. Well, especially on COVID. Maybe and, not that's so what I'm talking about. Abortion, Just though. That's the only thing that they think, it'll, well, I've talked to people about the vaccine mandates, and I go, what about my body, my choice? And literally, 
they will say, well, that only goes for abortion. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> right? It's like, what? They go, yeah, because abortion isn't contagious. Yeah, but I think your stupidity is. Because <laughs> yeah. you, you know what is contagious? The COVID-19 virus. You know what doesn't stop it from being contagious? That vaccine you want to mandate yeah. because you've been propagandized to think so. And But people are, that's another thing, you know, you brought it up earlier. I wanted to t- piggyback on it, is that at some point, people stop taking the boosters, right? So at some point, they stop listening to Stout or Fauci yeah. and CNN and MSNBC and Fox, and they stop listening to the garbage from the FDA and the CDC. So at some point, they realize, hey, I think they're lying. Well, people, they don't tell you that the two heads of the, in the FDA, the head of the vaccine department, the two heads that were there for 30 years quit over the booster. So it wasn't okay for them, but if I say something, I'm called a Trumper, a right winger, a white supremacist, if I go along with the same people who head the vaccine department at the FDA when they resign. So anyway, that that's a long answer to your question, but those are the things. So now everything's flipped, and now the only anti-war voices are coming from the Republicans. They're for freedom of speech. They're for bo- for uh, bodily autonomy. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. So yeah, I, I, I've stayed consistent, and because I've stayed consistent, and the Democrats have become authoritarian maniacs, pro-censorship, pro-war, then uh, if I'm against that, you're now a right winger. It's it's nuts. So the so uh, classical liberal typically refers to the founding fathers. It's a more libertarian view. It's considered to be center right libertarianism and then traditional liberal. They're very, very, very similar, but that's considered the center left liberal. 20 years ago, when I'm growing up, my family are all what would be described as social or traditional liberals, meaning we were upset about racism. We were upset about uh, prejudice. We were upset about these social issues and we had a very liberal perspective, but social liberals, which are uh, social and traditional liberals or Democrats 10, 20 years ago believed we can probably help solve some of these problems if we address them properly. But now you end up with the culture war today because what do we end up seeing? They're, they're advocating for racial segregation. We're seeing these, uh, the libraries yeah. in Seattle where it's like, yeah. de- it's like, uh, uh, what is it? P- POC, DEI meeting, uh, uh, non-POC meetings. Yeah. In Dearborn, Michigan, they did these digital cafes where there was one for white people, one not for white people. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, dude. That's that, I call that reactionary, yes. right? They, they try to call us reactionaries and right wing. Reactionary is a reference to those who tried to maintain the status quo in the French Revolution. So if my family... Uh, uh, literally my, my, my parents, my mom grows up before loving V Virginia when interracial marriage was illegal and before civil rights. And they had to lie about the relationship of my grandfather and my grandmother, because if people found out it was actually a felony and they had to flee several States, then the law changes. Loving V Virginia comes down. There's a ruling. Hey, guess what? You can be of any race and marry if you want. It's kind of crazy to think that was illegal. It's called miscegenation. And then what happens? You get someone like Derek Brown, the critical race theorist, who argues that school segregation, plus E.V. Ferguson, all this stuff, he wants the segregation. He wanted it. And that's the modern cultural left. So that is, that's a huge component for me. I'm like, I actually thought it was a good thing that for, for, for one of the first times in the history of humanity, we were like, it doesn't matter what your race is. And now they're trying to rewind that clock. It's, it's interesting you're saying this. And Rob, you pulled this up. I want to read this to you. Diversity numbers among delegates trigger alarm at DNC meeting. This is a political story, October 3rd. DNC officials express concern about failing, uh, falling short of diversity goals in big states like New York and California, with Donna Brazil noting whether it's African-American community, black community, the LGBTQ community, Hispanic community, numbers continue to decrease. The DNC uses a complex formula based on eligible voters from seven targeted groups to calculate diversity goals in California. The proposed number of black delegates is 12 percent, roughly double the percentage of African-Americans in the state. And the DNC is still in the process of approving delegate proposal plans for all 50 states and the District of Columbia. How diverse the convention delegation will be remains uncertain and increase competition from Republican Party for Latino voters adds complexity to the DNC efforts. So this is diversity of skin color. This is not diversity <laughs> of thought. And so they they want to have all the black, brown, Hispanic, and all the different uh, ethnicities and sexual genders, but the, we all want you to think exactly the same. And that's what the Democrats are actually bragging about, that we're all in lockstep. So it doesn't matter that they have diversity uh, in ethnicity or diversity in skin. or se- They all have, they have uniformity in thought, and that's what's going on. And it is a blue and on cult. 
and you can, and you're not allowed to question it all, or you're immediately shunned and called a right winger, which is what I've been called since I debunked RussiaGate. I was the first one to debunk it on the left. I had Bill Binion told me for a fact there's no way Russia hacked into the DNC server, and I knew it was a hoax ever since then. And so, and Seth Rich now they don't even want to let the Seth Rich, the FBI first they lied and said they didn't have Seth Rich's computer, then they said we did, but we can't access it. Then it said, of course we got it, we access it, but we're not going to share it with you for 65 years. So I guess I forgot how I got started on this, but that's the end of it. <laughs> By the way, this is this is the reason why Newsom cannot be a candidate for 2024. As much as the left is dying for him to be it, he cannot be because the only way Newsom could be the presidential candidate, and we, we've talked about him potentially being the most formidable one yeah. for sure, but the only route he can have for 2024 is for Biden to have health issues and then Kamala to step aside, and it's going to be a white yep. man yeah. taking got over. an African-American yeah. woman, and Republicans Jamaican. will come and say, yep. the organization that says you're so diverse, look what's happening with you. Well, let me, let me tell you about the diversity thing. Uh, I, 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 I grew up in a family where, uh, mixed, mixed race family, um, uh, second generation. So my grandparents on my mom's side, Korean woman, white dude, illegal, crime. And I grew up hearing these stories from my mom about how people would insult her and call her names and spit on her and things like that. I was like, wow, that's crazy. And then I see all this wonderful stuff from the Democrats about unity and no more racism. And I was like, we really did it, guys. I'm a little, this little kid with glistening eyes. I'm like, it's so cool that I got a friend who's Filipino. I got a friend who's from Poland. I got a friend who's black. I got a friend who's Hispanic. Man, we're like that McDonald's commercial for kids where it's all these different <laughs> yeah, people. Yeah. And I thought that was normal to me on the south side of Chicago where we, was, everything was very diverse. And then when I go to Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street literally created racial caucuses. Uh. They voted on how to, to spend money based on your race. So they had the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus and the Asian Caucus. And then they had the working groups. And if you were working sanitation, meaning you would clean the place, your vote could be overridden by a group of people just based on their race. And then I said, what the? I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, I went through stories, the horror stories from my family about racial segregation. And now y'all are doing it. That freaked me out. And this, this starts by in the path where I'm at Occupy Wall Street. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a relatively lefty guy. I've been my whole life listening to anar anarchist punk rock, lefty communist garbage. And uh, good songs still, by the way, but some of their messaging I wake up to when I'm getting older. And I'm watching these people racially segregate. Now, I can't speak for every single person who, who you know, is in the black community or the Latino community, the Asian community, because we're all different. My, my experience in life, I totally recognize those arguments from the left about the, the, the different experiences we all have. You know, a, a black trans woman is going to have a different experience from me, a mixed race Asian guy who grew up on the south side of Chicago. But I'll tell you this, when, when I have these people tell me outright, I got a guy come on my show, smacks the microphone, a white man comes on my show and tells me, I don't actually understand oppression because I look too white anyway. Wow. I don't care that he can say those things to me about the, the racial issue. I care that he's a hypocrite. And when I say to him, your logic dictates you submit to my worldview because I'm the mixed race person who's been oppressed by you, white man, they can't handle it. Their, their, their logic is simply white people are the oppressors and we're the majority. So you do what we tell you to do. And I'm like, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm more interested in people who are like, the, uh, there's a Yale study that came out several years ago that showed that white liberals talk down to black people and white conservatives do not. And I'm like, I think that exemplifies this quite a great deal. But let me ask you this. So when you were at Occupy Wall Street and you saw them siloing off into their little ethnic groups, right? To, when I see that now, I see that as coming from infiltrators, and that's exactly how the establishment wants them to organize, because if they organized all together, they would be formidable, and they could oppose the establishment. But if they silo us off into LGBTQ and trans, and then to black and Hispanic and Puerto Rican and everything, so then we don't come together and we keep fighting. And that's, that's, that's all that DEI stuff. It comes from BlackRock. Yes. It comes from the top <clears throat> down. It doesn't come from the bottom up, which is what I was trying to impress upon to Cornell West when he was on my show, you're repeating the, the establishment talking points when you keep talking about white supremacy and LGBTQ and trans. They want you to keep talking about that. They don't want you to organize along class lines. So don't you think that's uh, that's you're a right. Go ahead. You're right. Uh, the first when I, when I, the first weekend I was at Occupy Wall Street, there was a 60 year old couple with an American flag behind them. They they consider themselves constitutionalists. They weren't leftists. They weren't communists. They weren't DEI. None of that. They were libertarians. I met Luke Rutkowski of We Are Change. He's a free market, anarcho capitalist kind of guy. He was down there too because the message originally was the corporations, the big banks, and the government teamed up and screwed the American people over. And then there's that famous meme comic 
where you've got a bunch of people. There's, there's this fancy looking room, a guy at his desk, and outside the window is a bunch of people protesting and angry, holding up signs saying, we're the 99 percent. And the smug guy at the desk says, introduce identity politics. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. So and I, I, and I actually experienced the manipulation uh I don't know how you find this one. You got to find like the comic of the of the guy at his desk introduced identity politics. But there was the, a civil war at Occupy Wall Street. The East and West factions. Of, there was the General Union and the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. When everyone talks about Occupy, they only ever tell you about the General Assembly. There it is on the left. The General Assembly was the official narrative the media supported and got behind. And on the uh, other side of the park, which would have been, I believe, the west side of the park, was Rob, the General. Can you zoom in a little bit. It was the General Union. These were actual activists, people who are typically leftists, who are trying to find a way to organize. And here's the funny thing. Their organizing structure was based on the family. And these hippie lefty guys sleeping in a park told me the family is the most important political unit, which is really funny because you hear this from Trump supporters. And this is like a, this is a leftist guy in all black punk rock. And he said, here's how we want to organize. We all have tents. Each tent is a family. Our representative of our family will come and speak to the general union about how we distribute goods. When they tried holding a meeting, and raise, raising funds, facilitators, they called themselves, showed up and took their meeting over in the most cultish and psychotic way. Anytime one of these activists would try and make a statement, the facilitators would go, Mike, check, Mike, check, Mike, check. And the whole crowd would start chanting, Mike, check, and just stop talking. Go to these activists. I'm in San Bernardino, Trump supporters and, you know, quote, unquote, quote, unquote leftists. And I walk up with my camera and I was like, hey, you guys are protesting. Would, would anyone mind answering? Mike, check, Mike, check, Mike, check. Uh -huh. And I say, and I stand there and wait. They stop. And then I'm like, do you guys want to answer? And the woman goes, Mike, check. They all yell, repeating, do not, do not talk to, talk to anyone. And I'm like, it's a cult. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been and it's been all infiltrated and overtaken, and that's exactly that. I'm telling you, all this hate your neighbor stuff. It's all coming from the top down. It's not coming from the bottom up. And I think people are starting to wake. You know, when I brought a Boogaloo boy on my show, uh, because uh, the Boogaloo boy gave a speech about how he, he was with somebody from uh, 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 the what's that Antifa, and he was with some LGBTQ, and they were they all came together and said, well, "You're not my enemy. We're all brothers." And I was like, "This is amazing. I never even heard of a Boogaloo boy." until that so i bring the guy on my show he taught we agree on like six out of ten issues and uh, they're anti-war they're anti-cop they're all this stuff and i was like wow this is really amazing they're nothing like i was told and i and so th i never got an onslaught of hate and uh i got smear articles written yeah. about me in new york uh, new week and everything and it was because that's the only thing that scares them and so when i started to figure that out that's when i realized what the real game is and i'm not going to hate my neighbor because we're politically different because they don't have their yeah jimmy door boogaloo boy and view sparks outrage among mm -hmm. you're a sucker, sucker. They, but but you were not jimmy you were correct thank you there, there's a video of a boogaloo boy shaking hands with antifa yeah and uh, uh they were trying to create this division narrative in the press mm -hmm. and claim boogaloo boys were actually white supremacists and that's the exact opposite even yep. the adl said that the boogaloo boys were not racist but they uh, they Pete, the media conflated proud boys with boogaloo boys boogaloo boys were a response to the proud boys they wouldn't allow you to be racist and stuff like that and then when they started censoring people off uh, social media no longer could the boogaloo boys police their own kind because now you can't see what those people are saying if they said something racist in public they could see it. Now it went underground, and that's what they wanted. And that's a great way to, to infiltrate and, again, separate and keep everybody separated and hating but, each other. But also, as for the Proud Boys, uh, the media's lied completely about them as well. You don't have to like the guys. I mean, they, they, you know, they're showing up to protests and whatever you, whatever you think about them. But I was, in, I was in, I think it was Portland, and there was a planned march by a bunch of right-wing group, right group. I think it was Patriot Prayer, and the Proud Boys showed up. I am, the Proud Boys' plan was, we're going to march to the city. That's all we're going to do. But they know Antifa is going to show up and act a fool. And the general idea is, well, we're allowed to protest. They're not allowed to act a fool. We're going to, be a, we're going to do our thing. There was a black proud boy. And I think this is on my YouTube channel. I, I think I filmed it. And uh, as they're marching down the street, the, the Antifa guy started uh, yelling the N-word over and over and over again at him, mm. swearing at him and calling mm. him a variety of racial slurs. And then this dude, he, the, the, he's, he's a, he was a veteran. He was a black man. He just gets super angry, and he starts to walk towards the street to cross the street to the other side. And a white proud boy walks in front of him and grabs him and says, don't listen to him, man. Don't let him divide us. He's like, you're my brother. And he grabs his hand. He's like, you're my brother, man. Don't listen to them. And I was like, what the? 
I, I was like know. the the white and black proud boy doing the fist mm -hmm. grab saying they're brothers while the Antifa guy is yelling the N-word. You have this the? video? I think I, it, I'm it, pretty it, sure I've seen it, too. It might have been a live stream, and it would be on... It, it's, it, if you're, what a moment. And... And, but also understand, there was also a moment where these anti activists were screaming the N-word at ICE agents in, I think, Seattle as well. So Don't you think that ha half of the Antifa is infiltrated FBI people? Well, just yeah, like, or, yeah. Just like you see those guys uh, dressed up in the khakis and the masks. Those, yeah. <laughs> those guys are all fed. All of them. So, so all of them. If, 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 if I do have, th have the video of it, it's going to be a live stream from YouTube.com slash TimCast that I don't think we can find in 10 minutes because yeah. these are like three-hour, four-hour long streams. But so. you know what this is all reminiscent of, of what you're basically describing? You ever seen the movie Braveheart? No. I You've never see seen it. Braveheart, you yeah. guys? Multiple times. Okay, gotcha. So there's a scene, and this is essentially what you guys are describing, that the Scottish nobles, the Scottish lords, are sitting on top of a hill watching what they think is about to be a battle between Mel Gibson, uh, William Wallace's crew, and the other tribe that they're about to fight against, and they're walking to get against each other. They're about to meet in the in the middle of the battlefield, and they're looking on with such just like amazement. Like our two basic biggest thorns in our side are about to go to battle, and they meet and they come right together in front of each other, and they think it's about to be a battle, and they go, hey! and they, they yeah. slap hands like this, and you realize, holy shit! And in that moment. The, the Scottish nobles and the lords and the king, they knew they were fucked. Now, that's essentially the, the metaphor for the establishment. Once you have MAGA and BLM, and you have the Proud Boys and, and Antifa, or you have blacks and whites or Christians and Muslims, Muslims all sort of agreeing, being like, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. And they look towards the king, and the, ki and the king realizes he has no clothes on. That's where you'll see significant I change. I don't think anybody has to agree or high-five at all. I think all that has to happen is... You're going to have a group of conservatives, you're going to have a group of Boogaloo Boys, you're going to have a group of BLM, whatever these groups are, and they're going to have their areas. There's going to be a neighborhood, a bunch of houses, and everyone's there is going to be like, the police aren't helping us, crime is getting out of control, we, the rioters are not political, they're opportunists, they're going to form a neighborhood watch group. Then across, that, then a few blocks away or whatever, there's a different group with a different ideology. They don't need to be like each other. It's that one dude's going to be like, hey, I'm going to go, I, I know those guys are forming a group, let's go talk to them and see what's up. And then two guys are going to walk up, and it's going to be like, look, you believe a lot of weird lefty stuff that I don't care for, but I got no beef with you. Right? I just want to make sure my kids are safe. The other guy's going to say, you believe a bunch of weird right-wing stuff I don't agree with either, but I agree. I want my kids to be safe. Mm -hmm. So we, we won't fight with you guys. If you need help, let us know. We're going to do our thing. You do yours. That's where I think the king gets scared. Yeah, that's the, that's it. That's the only thing that scares them, and that's why they keep doing this, uh, all these culture wars to keep us distracted. And uh, I think you know, the, believe me, the establishment would be okay with any of those Republican candidates at that debate being president, including DeSantis. They yep. love it, and any of the Democrats being, they just don't want anybody like Trump or RFK. They don't want anybody that's actually outside the system or who's going to challenge Vivek, the, you know, or Vivek. Don't or, forget yeah. about him. They do they, not want him. Really? I'm assuming. What do you think about I, Vivek? Well, I don't know much about Vivek, but I think they'd be okay with Vivek. Well, I think there's a reason that they, they could turn all him. basically attacked him in the second debate. He clearly won that first debate. Uh -huh. And we were at that second debate. The knives were out across the board for this guy. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't think it, it. I don't think they'd like him. Uh, Vivek came on my show, and when he broke down what brought him into the culture war, my my view of Vivek is he's a very very smart guy. He knows how to control systems and machines. He's playing the political game very, very well. But deep within him is a lust for revenge. His story, you guys know his story of how, how the, he, got, he got into this? He has this big, big pharma company, biotech. He's raised, he, he makes it worth billions of dollars, whatever, putting his net worth near half a billion dollars. He's probably thinking to himself, I got the dream. I did it. I, I, you know, from Ohio, immigrant family. And he conquered. He rose above. And then one day... He gets a message where they're like, hey, you know, George Floyd died. You got to put up the black square on your profile. And he's like, what are you, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah. and he's like, you got to put up the black square. He's like, okay, fine. Then they come back to him and they say, now you got to issue a message in support of George Floyd. And he said, uh, sure, I guess. And then he writes a letter saying like, hey, this disunity is, 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 is so har harmful and I'm so, uh, it's so unfortunate. I hope this country can learn to heal and come together. Then they come to him again. Activists are hitting up his company and they said, your message wasn't good enough. Jeez. And then he breaks and he says, F off. He's like, I'm done with this. What's going on? Then they start attacking his board members and he starts getting resignations. That, I think, triggers him. Mm -hmm. And then he writes the book. He woke in. He creates this, this uh, uh, venture capital to oppose BlackRock. I, I feel like he thought he did it. 
He did what he was supposed to do. He became successful. And then the, the, the divert, like the, the DEI stuff comes in and they're trying to use it to destroy him. They're telling him to bend the knee to them as if his success didn't matter. And then people are resigning. He sees the, the BlackRock stuff, the ESG, and he creates a fund to counter it. Now, now I'm looking at him and his personality is different when he's on stage, when he's doing politics. He's talking very different and very, yeah, because he wants to win. I, I, I think his, his attitude is more so a calculating, I hate what these people tried to do to me, and I'm going to win now. Okay, I hope so. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's a, the, uh, let me go. The least look. amount of words that Jimmy has said. You don't, you don't, you don't so. have to like him. I, I'm going to be honest. I told this to Vivek. He's not going to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but what's I, but the I, reason he's not going to win? You can't beat Trump. Come on. Vivek, just that? I think Vivek is fantastic. I think, you know, people talk about um, whether it's someone is doing so something for the right reasons or the wrong reasons. And I'm like, I can't read someone's mind. I can only look at Vivek has started a fund to counter BlackRock and Vanguard and all those things, right? He wants to actually provide funding to companies that oppose that. That's good. You don't got to trust the guy. He did a thing I liked. People are like, Donald Trump's only doing this because he's, he's got an ego and he's a narcissist. And I'm like, oh, okay. He's exposing our, our oil fields in Syria because of his ego. I'll take it. It's better than the liars who are running the garbage system for their benefit and then lying to us about it. So you don't have to, you don't have to trust him. You don't have to like him. Maybe he's in it for himself. Maybe he wants to be famous. Maybe he's brand building. I'll take the good thing that it, the good things. I got that he's three stories for. before we wrap up. Here's one of them. Adidas CEO Kanye West didn't mean anti-Semitic remarks. This is a Reuters story. <laughs> Adidas CEO Bjorn Golden defended Kanye West, stating, I don't think he meant that. He said, and I don't think he's a bad person, regarding Yee's anti-Semitic remarks that led to the termination of their Yeezy collaboration. Golden acknowledged that Yee has made statements that weren't that good and praised him as one of the most creative people in the world, both in music and what I will call street culture. Adidas maintained its decision to end the partnership with Yee, with a spokesperson confirming uh, in, uh, affirming ending the partnership was appropriate. You think there's going to be a comeback of you coming to Adidas? What, what do you think when you hear this story? I think the whole thing was a setup. I think it was planned. I think Ye is a genius. And uh, based on my interview with him, the way he was talking to us before the show is nothing like his public persona. He was calm, rational, completely lucid, having a real conversation. He was, he was acting like this. He was like, so what do you think about if I were to do X, Y, and Z, right? You, what, what, what's, what's going on with Mike Pence? How do they feel about him? That's how he was talking. Yeah. Camera turns on. Yo, man, I'm telling you, you got the guy in these banks. And I was like, what the just happened? And then he had a private jet waiting for him after the show ended. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't know how you book a private jet in a couple hours. Oh, right? wow. <laughs> that's right. Oh, wow. That's because if you guys fly in private jets, you know you got to charter these things in advance. they got to get ground crews. When the ground crew is notified, oh, it's eight a hour headache. wait I period. Stop it. <laughs> that's a real headache. <laughs> so, I just go southwest. Yeah. I get, <laughs> but you, after, can, you can buy the pre board. So stressed out. You know, it's, <laughs> now, i got to be honest. It's, it's, you know, with, but, it's, it's flying commercial is a nightmare. They United took me off of my first class ticket. And rebooked me without telling me at four in the morning onto a, uh, a a seat all the way in the back economy minus whatever it's called mm -hmm. that, that that thing where you're not allowed to have a carry on and I was like bro I paid a thousand dollars for this flight because we had to we had to, we, you know we're going to this trip uh. and uh, I was coming home and then they were like too bad take the flight or stay and I'm like uh. what am I supposed to do but anyway so yeah so you just, so you were saying Tim about so so he's on the I, I, I'm curious on where the setup is because if he's on camera. Off camera speaking one certain way, all of a sudden cameras on, like almost some MK Front Ultra page of every crazy. newspaper. Yeah, and then and then I, I get the point that you were making, like, and Pat knows this, like trying to get a freaking it's a system, they gotta get people's names, they gotta pre-board, pre-check you, and do all that stuff. So you're saying like as right. set up in what <clears throat> sense? So uh, Shane Cashman, one of our writers, is a huge Yay fan. Mm -hmm. And he talks, he wrote this article about how Ye has these periods where he shocks the world in an offensive way, and then leaves for a little bit, then has a major comeback. It's like a PR strategy or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. He comes out and he says all these things. He agrees to come on our show. Before the show, while we're talking, totally lucid and calm, he says, I have no reason to be on a show like this. <laughs> and I said, you're completely right. I was like, you know, why are you here? Like, you don't get more famous. If you want to come, and come on my show, I appreciate it. And he's like, well, these guys told me I should do it. But he's like, what I'm really interested in is you telling me how I become president. And I said, ballot harvesting. He's like, ballot harvesting. I'm like, <laughs> I said, you want to know how the Democrats won? They don't win by, by convincing people. They win by getting more votes. And you get more votes if you're ballot harvesting. He goes, ballot harvesting. He writes it down. He goes, I got what I needed. Shut up. Not kidding. Show starts. And all of a sudden, he goes from this calm, lucid guy to, leave. to yo, man, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a PJ if you keep talking like that. And then he gets up and he walks out. And I'm like, is he, he's smiling. 
Yeah. He goes downstairs. He thanks everybody. Shakes hands. He tells my writer, "You want to come with me back to L.A. and 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 work with on some stuff?" Plane was waiting for him. I I I called our our charter company, and I said, "Did you give him like? Did you give him a plane? Like what happened?" And they were like, "No, no, no, no." And I'm like, "Frederick Municipal has a private jet. I think it was like a Gulfstream or something waiting for Yay. And I'm I, I, I he can leave. I'm not, I'm not mad about that. But how did he get a PJ in an hour? And she and my my broker, my, the charter lady, she's like, "That's not possible." Wow. So the plane, he knew it. the yes, he and knew. then people are like, "Why would he do that?" Because he got the front page of every newspaper yeah. by walking out on the show. I see that. If he does an interview on, like, okay, Timcast IRL is a big show. I get it. We 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 typically have like some of the highest li live numbers. I think we're the biggest live show consistently every night on YouTube. But we're no. I don't beat biggest. you. You're sure I'm, I don't beat you. We, you don't beat us. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'm kidding. But, I, <laughs> but like, we're, we're not the biggest show in the world or anything like that. You know, in terms of podcasts, we do well. So people are like, why would he go on your show? And I'm like, doing an interview with me gets him nothing. He does the interview. There are some clips. People roll their eyes. Storming off the interview yeah. is hot press for all the tabloids. Big but, time. And but, but, but Tim, he that, just, that was your I think show. the important question is, what color is your PJ, uh, Jimmy? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, his pajamas or his private well, jet? I mean, everybody's wondering, like, PJ. Why was he his, his yeah. PJ? <laughs> and Pat, didn't private he, did, didn't he yeah. just right, trademark? Yeah. Yesterday, he trademarked 25 names uh, for U's. Y E W S. Kanye did that, which is sounds it's, like Yeezus and Jews. I don't know what he's. Did you see but, that? But, but, oh, there it he is. He trademarked Jews. Jews. Wow. But I, I, I want to give some context too because uh, I, I'm. I, you guys have flown on private jets, right? Yeah. Once yeah. I, well, Jimmy, I have not. multiple but, times. Uh, <laughs> but what people need to understand is, it it's it's not as it, people assume you have to have a multi million dollar jet. It's not. Some private jets only cost a couple hundred grand. No, no joke. If you if you look up on these websites, you can find a lot of the jets that they charter and they fly are from 1980, and they're like two hundred thousand dollars to buy. I'm not saying people have two hundred grand, but it's not ten million dollars like you see these CEOs on Gulf Streams. Chartering a private jet can be six thousand, eight thousand dollars. If you've got eight or eight to twelve people, and you're trying to fly last minute for work. It could actually be cheaper than flying commercial if you're if you're working in a corporation. What, what kind of plane is this? Is this the kind of plane that's crashed six to eight thousand no, dollars? No, tur tur turbo props. Yeah. Yeah. We, we should look into turbo this props. Next time you want to go. No, we're, we're, but Tim, well, Tim, back to your master plan from Kanye. Okay, th that was his master plan for your show. Well, I don't know. I, don't, no, well, I, I mean, this is all speculation, but it seems pretty accurate. I, I just, from your opinion, because you he did this on your show, but it was part of a bigger master plan. What's his overall master plan to get in the headlines? All right, because so one can argue, all right, I'm going to run up on stage and I'm going to tell Taylor Swift that it should have been Beyonce. All right, cool. You know, Mike eyeballs, Myers, George awesome. W. Bush doesn't care about black right? people. Yeah. Mike Myers, yeah, George W. Okay, awesome. Hey, I'm going to marry Kim K. I'm going to get all the, I'm going to, all the women in the world are going to, all right, my next album. Okay, and amazing. All right, I'm going to team up with Jay-Z, Jay Watch Mar the Throne. Now, marrying gonna, Kim K wasn't a stunt. He loved that woman. Obviously, yeah. but there was, was some love. stunt going involved there. <laughs> then, all right, I'm going to go see uh, uh, Donald Trump with Jim Brown. I'm going to do all that. Walk me through. Let me go full pro Hitler, anti-Jew, Death Con Three. Walk me through the marketing strategy for that. You, I, I mean, I, I can only speculate, but he's a billionaire. He's done. Not it. anymore. <laughs> yeah, but it, that, what does it really mean to be a billionaire? I, it, like, if you're talking about paper value and like shoe deals are worth a couple hundred million dollars, the dude wants for nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I, you look at some of these people; they get to that point where they're bored. I had a buddy of mine became a millionaire at 16. I, I didn't meet him when we were 16. I met him when we were in our late 20s. And he told me that for most people, at least that he knows, especially in the tech sector, they have an existential crisis once they get to that level of money. So like for him, he's like this young guy. He comes up with this idea. They start building this thing. And then all of a sudden, he's got millions of dollars. And he's sitting there staring at the wall like, what do I do? All my friends are at work. I'm not. I don't have to do anything now. I, I sold out. There's no company anymore. I don't need anything. And it was like a switch flip where they had, he had an existential crisis. And he says, a bunch of my friends experienced this. So you look at someone like, yeah, and I'm like, he's bored. He's bored and it's funny. And there's nothing you can do about it because he's more powerful than you. It makes him laugh. He wants to see what will happen. He wants to challenge preconceived notions. He wants to break people out of what he perceives as the matrix. He made a point that a lot of people praised when he said that he loved Hitler. And people were shocked by it. And I think the point he was trying to make was, as a Christian, he loves everyone, even the most evil people. He wants salvation for them. But he also knows that by saying something so shocking, you would freak out. And he's trying to prove that point that you don't love people. And I'm like, I can understand why nobody likes Hitler, dude. Are you crazy? Hmm. But he's trying to make a point. I could only speculate. He wants to shock you.
It's punk rock. I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but what was it? Sid Vicious wore a swastika. It's, it's like, why did he do that? Jimmy, why are you smiling? You got this big smile. Jimmy knows what's going on. Jimmy's like, listen, I've been a billionaire since 16 years old. <laughs> Jimmy, is there anything you'd like to say about PJs. the Jews right now? <laughs> well, I remember when this happened, uh, my friend called me. He goes, hey, did you hear did the Jews cancel Kanye? And I was like, did they catch him shipping arms to Nazis in Ukraine? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, he just said some stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's bad, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, but did well, the Jews cancel Kanye or did he actually cancel himself? Because like, it sounds like this was part he's not, of he's a... He's uncancelled. Yeah, he's, is that what happened? Guy, he's no. back. He's back? Okay. Yeah, but, and Tim, you made a point earlier. Like, if he got cancelled for saying those words, the Canadian Parliament had an actual <laughs> Nazi on the right. goddamn well, floor. Well, they should have cancelled the Canadian... They shut down Canada. Are you freaking kidding me? And I get it. Words hurt. But for that moment to wow. go down mm -hmm. and they, what they do, they just fire the, the Speaker of the House, just yeah. steps down. Yeah. You had a, a Nazi that actually killed Jews. Ste that That is absurd. A Hitler Nazi. A Hitler yeah. Nazi. Not a regular... Not a Nazi. Yeah. Like, yeah. The original. The OG. I'm not a OG. OG. Yeah. Old yeah. school. <laughs> School. Not that right. new not brand. Last could story you, here before we wrap yeah, up. Just look at, could you imagine being that Nazi? He's getting oh, a standing ovation oh my God. and waving to everybody. Oh, he's like, like, what the? He's like, this is yeah. the best day of my life. Yeah. I, I, no, no, but imagine what he's thinking to him. If you only know what I did to oh your Oh, my guy. God. Yeah. Oh, my God. What's the story, Pat? Yeah, so let's wrap this up with Putin. So Putin, uh, a story comes <laughs> out. Um... <laughs> About next generation nuclear weapon, he says Russia's mission is to create a new world. And then this speech comes out. If you got the clip, Rob, to just play the clip, here's what he says on this video. Uh, go ahead and play it. There's probably a question hanging in the air about what happened to the company's management and so on. But we know about the plane crash. The head of the investigative committee reported to me just the other day that fragments of hand grenades were found in the bodies of those killed in the crash. There was no external impact on the airplane. This is an established fact. The result of the examination conducted by the investigative committee of the Russian Federation. But the investigation is not completed. Yes, unfortunately, the presence of alcohol or drugs in the blood of the dead the examination was not conducted, although we know that after the famous events in the company in St. Petersburg, the FSB found not only 10 billion in cash, but also five kilograms of cocaine. But I repeat once again, in my opinion, such an examination should have been carried out. Rob, but is this a video I sent out. you? Is this a video I sent you? Uh, this, oh, I'm sorry. That might be the... I was just going to say... What is he Pergosian's... You saw uh, oh, oh. I was, was going to say the cocaine. Yeah. That means it's CIA, right? I was like, Pergosian? So that means he... Basically, what he was saying is, though, they, there was a grenade on the plane, but Putin's like, yeah, but there was cocaine, too. Yeah. Like, who yeah. gives the damn... No, no, People no. People on cocaine oh, play with video. grenades. I That's not this, the video I, I wanted him to play. I, I want him to I play the, this video. Oh, okay. Play this video, Rob. Read. <laughs> Ответ является абсолютно неприемлемым для любого потенциального агрессора. Потому что э, с момента обнаружения старта ракет, откуда бы это ни исходило, из любой точки мирового океана, либо с какой бы то ни было территории, э, в ответ на встречном ударе в воздухе появляется такое wow. количество, столько сотен, сотен, сотен наших э, ракет, что шансов на выживание ни у одного противника Wow. Not a single enemy has yeah, had a chance of survival. He, he's not messing Not a around. single enemy. Do you think he means it? Yep. I actually think there's a strong possibility he, he begins using nuclear weapons over Ukraine. The, uh, understand nuclear weapon does not mean ICBM. It could be uh, nuclear artillery. It could be lower yield, 100 kiloton bombs. But uh, on the battlefield... Uh, uh, Putin has already stated the use of depleted uranium rounds coming from the UK uh, constitutes the use of nuclear weapons. And thus, you know, their actions are warranted. If it came to the point where Putin was losing, and I think if you look at the battle map, he secured the region he wanted to secure. If he really wanted Poland, oh, yeah, he'd start using tech, uh, nuclear artillery. And then no one, there, there was actually a Polish MPI said there will not be mutually assured destruction because no one in their right mind would sacrifice New York over, a, uh, I forgot what city he said, a, a, like a small town in Poland, right? That if, if Putin actually did nuke a NATO country, there's not going to be nuclear war. The West will not retaliate. And if that is true and coming from a NATO nation, I mean, if you pull up the quote, it's probably it's more specific. because I forgot what Polish city they said. I do not see a scenario 
in which the West fires nuclear weapons at Russia if Russia uses nuclear weapons in Eastern Europe? Well, I just think that the world's terrorist is the United States military and NATO. And if you look around the globe, there's over 800 military bases for the United States and NATO, and they're building more and more. We've surrounded China and uh, Russia, and the aggressors is obviously NATO in the United States. And we're the only country that's ever been proven to use nuclear weapons. And the people who run our military industrial complex are bloodthirsty maniacs who have killed millions of people over the last two decades and displaced millions and millions more for uh, economic lust. And that's what this is. That's what the Ukraine war is about. That's what China is about. That's what Syria was about. Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan. It's all about an upward transfer of wealth from the tax base to uh, the military industrial complex and the international security state. And then, of course, fossil fuel companies. That's what this is about. That's why we're selling more liquefied natural gas right now. That's why we blew up that pipeline. That's what this is all about. And that's what for, and Russia just doesn't want Ukraine to be put into to NATO. That's the only demand. And they said, go pound sand. We're not going to give you that because we want you to invade Ukraine. We want this war. This is how we make money. And this is how all empires end, by the way. And this is how we're ending. We're starving our own people at home while we uh, ex uh, do these military adventures over overseas. And we're not stopping. And this is what all Matt Gates is about. It was about, so we got to stop this. And you see what's happening. You're, he's going to be, I bet there's going to be criminal charges against him. Don't you think they're going to? Of gonna, course. Of th course. This is why men keep thinking about the uh, uh, Roman Empire. Yep. Big You've seen that TikTok going trend. On TikTok. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but uh, uh, it's funny because these women are all like, why are men thinking about the Roman Empire? It's like, because we are witnessing. <laughs> we are witnessing it. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's funny though that none of this happened. Like, this was supposed to be happening under Trump. That's what? exactly. You, and so they said that Trump, he was the guy who's alienating all our friends and the people don't respect us. The exact opposite happened. Uh, uh, Biden comes into power, and now there are all these other countries joining together, coalescing in economic power centers like BRICS to oppose the United States that was not there before. And we're pushing China and Russia together, which is the last <laughs> thing we were supposed to want. They don't care. And we've always were afraid of Germany coming, journeying with their, uh, with their engineering and their capital coming together with Russia's manpower and their natural resources. And we've been worried about that for decades. And that's what was happening with the Nord pipeline. And that's what this is all about. And, you know, uh, when Trump got elected in 2016, I, that wasn't just happening in America. That was also Brexit happened. People were starting to revolt against the establishment. And that's why they got to do this national security state. They got to put everybody under surveillance and take away your freedom of speech. And they got to divide everybody because it's not just in the United States. People around the world are waking up and getting sick of the establishment. So we'll, I hopefully there'll be a worldwide revolution to happen soon. Well, for what it's worth, this was an insane podcast. Loved we talked it. about a bunch of different things. Appreciate you guys for coming out, both of you. Here's what we learned. We learned today, okay, that Tim Pool's favorite vault flavor is black cherry. It's good. Yeah, it is. Okay? Although you did try the cucumber mint yesterday, mm -hmm. and, you know. I don't like cucumber or mint. It's, it's still good. Yeah, me too. But he also liked the pow pow. <laughs> The That's pop, coming right. soon. But Matt Gates yesterday is like, I had four of these already. I'm Did, feeling yeah. Great. yeah, Matt had like four of them himself. It unlocks your brain. Yeah. So, it, 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 by the way, indirectly, go order a case of Vault and try it for yourself. Unleash the inner genius. Rob, let's put the link on for Amazon, folks right? to do that. It's on Amazon. You can get the different flavors. On Amazon. Aside from that, uh, Jimmy, do you have anything that's going on right now you want the I'm gonna audience be, to do? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing a show tonight in uh, Boca Raton at the, the Black Box Theater. Oh, sick. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow night I'll be at the Improv in Orlando. And next week I'll be at the House of Blues in Houston and another place in Dallas. So go to JimmyDoor.com and click on tour and we'll see you at a live show. Fantastic. Tim, anything on your end? Oh, well, we just wrapped our big show last night. Great so show. Other than that, we're going to go home. I, I really appreciate you coming down, but people can just check out our work at TimCast.com. Tim Cast IRL, uh, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. on YouTube. And for some of you guys that want to get a discounted private jet, uh, you can email them as well. <laughs> a PJ. Uh, it's a PJ. A discounted PJ. And, and Pat, can I, can I say my, my last one, Hi. too? Because uh, Tampa Improv, October 18th. Jimmy was just there. You were just there at the Tampa yeah. Improv. Yeah. It was amazing, It's a right? great club. The guy who runs it, I love it. And I'll be there October 18th. Go to um, at Vincent O'Shawn on my Instagram. The ticket link is in my bio. Fantastic, gang. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye, bye-bye.